seven. We just met um, for a little while in executive session, so <clears throat> thank you all for, for coming. Um, before I get started tonight, uh, I just wanted to um, ask, your, ask for your indulgence here on a brief uh, moment of silence for um, the Commonwealth's late governor, Paul Salucci, who was uh, with a memorial uh, uh, to him today in the State House. And I'd like to just ask for a moment of silence for Governor Salucci. Thank you. Um, to go over uh, the agenda tonight, we'll have uh, public participation. We'll have an update on school safety from our superintendent. We'll have a presentation on district determined measures and common core alignment from uh, our assistant superintendent and department heads. Uh, approval of the school calendar for next year, the approval of the uh, job description. Uh, vote to approve our district goals for next year. The superintendent's report, update on our Thompson rebuild project. Monthly financial report, subcommittee reports. Our consent agenda, followed by a secretary's report. And uh, if necessary, and I believe it may well be, uh, motion, uh, entertain a motion to enter executive session once again. Um, <clears throat> so, not sure, I didn't see the list. Is there any public participation? Currently? Chat of the year. No? None? Okay. We'll uh, move on to uh, update on school safety. Dr. Bodie. Uh, there was a request to just have an end of the year report on how we've been doing with um, securing the buildings. Though I will say the school safety and security also extends to um, the types of practice and drills that we do so that students and staff are both ready in the case of an emergency. And I will say with this, that particular issue, um, we have met all of our goals with respect to fire drills and lockdown procedures at every school. And um, uh, Ellen Digby, who is the person in the district who is responsible for making sure that all happens and, and, and making sure that every school uh, meets those requirements, um, has assured me that that has happened this year. With respect to the buildings w being locked and secured, the Let's talk about each level. At the elementary school, I believe that, and, and I'm very confident, that we have very secure schools. One of the things that we, uh, we added to our protocols this year um, was making sure that when teachers and students left the building for recess, that the door behind them locked. And, they, and for a while there, we were in some buildings, they had to go around to the front door and buzz in, but that be became pretty um, inconvenient. So we did re-lock, uh, re put new locks into those doors, and we have a s secure key system where teachers are able to exit and enter um, through a locked door that always remains locked. At the middle school, the same, though they don't go out for recess. Um, but you cannot get into the building unless you are buzzed in. And that even happens for the gym classes as well that go out and play on the field. So the security there is, I think, is very tight. I, I know that one parent mentioned that another, someone held the door open for them and they were able to enter and not without identifying themselves. And, uh, you know, I think as our consciousness about security grows, um, there'll be less of that, and th that's sort of hard as a school system to entirely um, make sure it doesn't happen, though um, we have been trying to change the culture around that as well as we go forward. So I know the building principals have uh, addressed that in different ways in their own schools. Our, our challenge still remains the high school, and I get a range of complaints. Frankly, more of the complaints is nobody can get in when they want to get in and, you know, and making sure that everybody's on board as to when the doors need to be open for community ed or for school committees or any other kinds of meetings. Um, but one of the challenges we have is that, you know, our, our 
support staff has decreased over the years due to budget reductions. And we really only have two people in the, in the office and both are very busy. You imagine a high school this size that one person is managing really uh, the, the phones and the buzzers most of the time. What we really need to have, and this won't solve all of our problems, but it certainly will go a long way to, to improving the situation, is to have someone that sits at that front desk in the foyer throughout the day, has the ability to do the buzzing in, check people, making sure that they sign in, that they have badges, they, we know where they're going in the building, they, to the extent possible, notify the people in the building that they're coming. Um, particularly now that we have central registration mm -hmm. in the high school, um, there have been some issues with that even in the last couple of weeks. So th my recommendation, uh, at least going forward for next year, is that we do have someone in that role. Um, we did not include that as an additive position when we were discussing the budget, but um, my so I'm asking that we that you make a motion to that we could add that position and where I would find the money to pay for it would be out of the international revolving account. Um, and then next year we'll look at how it becomes part of the base budget going forward. But I do think that would be important. And uh, the other piece is that we are looking to put a proposal together uh, this summer for capital looking at um, providing more cameras um, and secure doors, um, primarily at the high school, but certainly at Audison and the elementaries as well. And once we have that proposal together, we will share it with you, and that will be ready for capital. Uh, usually their deadline is sometime in August. Is that that's right? Um, so that that's an update. So the, propo the proposal I have is that you uh, vote to or make a motion to uh, authorize me to hire someone for that position, it would be at a TA salary. Okay. Kim, please. Um, so moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any questions for Dr. Bodie on this issue? Okay. Moving on. Um, district determined measures, common core alignment. I see a lot of uh, department heads here with us tonight. Thank you and, and good evening. Yes. Kim. We should introduce everyone, yes. um, and, I pre and I really appreciate them coming this evening because they're, it's a busy, busy time of the year, as they all know. Um, these represent our, our five core department chairs. We have Deb Perry, who is our K-12 um, English Language Arts Department Chair, Matt Coleman, Mathematics, Larry Weathers, Science, Carrie Dunn, Social Studies History, and Catherine Ritz, World Languages. So I'll turn this over to, to Laura. We're actually going to start with the um, presentation on the Common Core alignment um, because it is from this that the district determined measures. This is what the district determined measures will be measuring. So we, I wanted to start a little bit um, with this. And there are some slides in here that are very dense, and they're mainly for your information and not to actually um, go over in great detail this evening. I want to talk a little bit um, to remind everybody about the our overarching view of the Common Core State Standards, uh, talk about the major changes that we have put in in terms of literacy and numeracy, give you a current status on our implementation, and talk a little bit about the work that lies ahead. We've been talking a lot about the Common Core over the last year, and we really needed to boil it down to just exactly what does this look like and what does it mean to our students. So if we take the pages and pages and pages of documentation, and there are quite a few of them, on the Common Core, basically it boils down to this. We need to prepare our students to work both independently and collaboratively. They need to be able to analyze and synthesize multiple sources of evidence of varying types. We need to be able to use that evidence. They need to be able to use that evidence in creation of robust arguments, and they need to be able to com communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital forms. This is what the Common Core means across all subject areas. The ability to analyze and synthesize multiple sources of evidence is important in English language arts, in social studies, in science, and in mathematics. 
and even in world language. The ability to create those <coughs> um, uh, arguments using that evidence, again, crosses all subject areas, and students need to be able to communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital forms. And why is it important to, to sort of melt it down to this? And that is when you hear the district determine measures, and as we go through the rest of the slides, you're going to hear the word evidence over and over again. When you hear the district determine measures, you're going to hear analyze and synthesize over and over and over again. And you're going to hear things about performance tasks, which are a student's ability to communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital form. So this is at the heart of everything that we do. When we look at major elements in literacy and what the changes that we've had to make in terms of our curriculum, and we discussed this last time when we talked about the calendar, questions came about, well, we've spent a whole year on the Common Core. Why are we not done? And my answer was that we're done with the, or, or we're fairly done with the documenting of the curriculum, but we, the biggest change in the Common Core is not so much what year you cover what topic, but rather what you ask students to do to be able to demonstrate their knowledge about that topic. So in the area of literacy and reading, there's a staircase of complexity. So students go all the way from the beginnings of reading um, until the demands that are at college and career uh, ready. And they need to be ready for that no later than at the end of high school. And so that's something that we had to realign our curriculum to match. We'll look at progressive development of reading comprehension so that students are advancing through the grades are able to gain more and more from what they read. And that's often termed um, as going from learning to read to reading to learn. They need to be able to read a diverse array of classic and contemporary literature, as well as informational text. And you'll hear a lot about that. Um, students need to be able to be able to gain insights, explore possibilities, and broaden their perspectives. And so we've been working K through 12 at what does literacy look like in terms of reading across all subject areas uh, to make sure that students will be able to meet the needs of the Common Core. In terms of writing, again, the word argument comes back. Substantive claims, talking about evidence, sound reasoning, which you'll hear when we talk about the theories of uh, the uh, pract mathematical practices. You'll hear um, Ms. Dunn talk about research and the focus on research and social studies, and that also comes across in the area of science. It's emphasized through all the standards, but most prominently in the writing strand. Literacy doesn't just involve reading and writing. It also involves speaking and listening in the Common Core standards. So students need to be able to not only gain that information, but uh, gain it through listening and speaking. They need to be able to have academic discussions in one-on-one, -on -one, small group, and whole class settings. So when you hear about the common assessments, you're not going to hear only about paper and pencil tests, but you're also going to hear about other performance assessments. And formal presentations are one way in which students need to have this talk occur, but also informal settings. And those settings need to inc uh, include digital settings, blogs, and uh, online discussions. Vocabulary has a very big emphasis on the Common Core state standards, and so our English language arts and literacy people have been working on how does it look to build that vocabulary. Students need to be able to use formal English, but they also need to be able to make informed and skilled choices. They need to be able to choose the right word and know what the right word would be in each circumstance. The vocabulary and conventions are, not, are treated in their own stand, uh, strand, not because they're in isolation, but that they go across the areas of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And so I know, for example, Deb Perry has been working with our teachers um, on the discussion of how do you teach grammar and not make kids hate reading and writing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what is the vision of implementation of literacy on the Common Core? It ha it's cross-disciplinary. The literacy expectations are so that students must be prepared to enter college in the workforce. So what does that look like in practice? Because this is where the rub comes in. Not so much aligning everything on paper, but what it looks like in the classroom. There's an increased rigor. Students need to ab the ability to quickly review and analyze information, and that is not something they are born doing. We need to teach them how to do that. Again, take a stance, create an argument defend that stance with evidence. They need to move well beyond summarization and narrative writing. 
Um, many oftentimes in, in the beginning years especially, we want students to be able to enjoy writing, so we have them writing narratives primarily. Um, that was under the, the formal curriculum. Now we're going to have to be doing informational writing at a very, very early age, right from the beginning. And we need to combine the research and thinking required to understand content area texts and the application of writing skills that are needed. So here's an example of what a prompt might look like that matches the Common Core State Standards from the SATs. You'll notice that this prompt um, provides some background information and then asks students to plan and write an essay in which they develop their point of view on this issue. But they need to support their position with reasoning and examples taken from reading, studies, experience, or observations. They are not asking people to write about their opinion. They're asking them to use evidence to back up their argument. What does that look like in an AP class? Because they may come in in kindergarten, but their goal is to get them here. So there's a sample synthesis essay prompt that talks about television and how it has been influential in presidential elections. It's telling students that they need to take information from six sources, including the introductory information from each source, and then synthesize that information <coughs> from at least three of these sources and incorporate it into a coherent, well-developed essay. If that's what our students need to do by the end, and by the way, these are the sources, one from a book, one from an online article, one from an article in the New Yorker, one from a, a chart that uh, gives some data information, another excer and excerpts from two other books. So in about 45 minutes to an hour, students need to look at this information and then write. How does this skill develop? If you get to there where the AP, where do students need to start? As early as kindergarten, we need students to use a combination of drawing, dictating, and writing to state an opinion or a preference about something, but they need to use evidence. As early as kindergarten, they need to use these things to compose an informational piece. They need to name the topic and supply information about the topic. So all the way from kindergarten to AP, that's what literacy looks like in the Common Core, and that's what we've been working on aligning with this year. In terms of major elements in numeracy, elementary school begins with the focus on number systems and works through our uh, basic operations. And to those things that are the bane of the existence of many a math teacher, fractions, negative numbers, and the beginnings of geometry. That's what we come up with in K through five, and Matt Coleman's been working with the teachers to make sure that their curriculum is aligned in terms of topics this year. When we look at grades 7 through 12, we're building on that solid foundation. And we're, our hope would be, and this is, a, this is a big goal, that students who have completed 7th grade and have mastered the content and skills through 7th grade and mastered the key word here, will be well prepared for algebra in the grade 8. Every student. Now that's a goal. We're not going to be there right from the start, but that is our goal. The middle, middle school school standards are robust and they have rich preparation for high school mathematics. High school standards call, students to, call on students to practice mathematical ways of thinking to real world issues. It also prepares students to go out into college and career readiness to use mathematics in a, a number of situations. And in this case, the key word in that last bullet item is novel situations, to apply mathematics to problems that they have not seen before. Mathematics in grades 7 through 12 needs to emphasize mathematical modeling. That modeling needs to uh, link, again, classroom mathematics and statistics, which you'll, you heard Matt talk about earlier this year, adding statistic class back, back in to everyday life. When making these mathematical models, technology is valuable to varying assumptions, exploring consequences, and comparing predictions with data. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Common Core Standards as early as kindergarten, students need to use uh, technology in both literacy and numeracy, and those are things that we attended to this year. But we need to connect the mathematical standards of, for practice to the common uh, mathematical standards for content. And so we need to look at that base, because if students don't have that base then they're, um, of understanding of that content, they are not going to be able to go to the areas of practice. Just to remind you, these are the standards for mathematical practice, and we need to assess both the standards of content and the standards of mathematical practice. We also need to instruct students so that they are capable of being able to achieve on those assessments. <coughs> 
I'm not going to go through these slides in order, um, in detail, but this is for your um, reference if you want to look back at later at what topics are covered in each grade level so that you can see how we are building towards high school. So where are we now? All our content in, um, is aligned in terms of scope and sequence. The majority of the alignment is documented in Atlas Rubicon, which is our online curriculum mapping system. It will be our focus for the summer and the 13-14 school year to focus on instructional and assessment changes. The scaffolding to increase student expertise and analyst analysis and synthesis. Uh, we need to have explicit instruction and evaluation and selection of evidence because too often, as you know, students Google and they get 450,000 pieces of evidence and they don't know how to tell which ones are the best ones and we need to work with them on that. There needs to be regular practice in the use of making evidence-based arguments and there has to be a significant emphasis in the use of discourse across all subject levels, especially for students to demonstrate what they know and are, and are able to do. So we have two days for each elementary grade for curriculum work and math this summer. Again, focusing more on the instructional techniques and the mathematical practices and discourse. One day for each subject area in 7 through 12 math. Two days for elementary grade level work in literacy, cross-curriculum work in social studies and literacy, Tech University to focus on leveraging technology in order to change instruction, and PD's experiences for our teacher. And, and I, I have to thank Linda Hansen for calling this to my attention. As we looked at that first slide at the beginning that talks about, and I'm going to flip all the way back to it if I can do it fast enough. the overarching view of Common Core State Standards. If we are expecting students to be able to work independently and collaboratively, then we have to have our teachers be able to do that. If we need to be able to analyze and <coughs> have our students analyze and synthesize multiple sources of evidence of varying types, we need to give teachers experiences to do that because this is not the education that they grew up in. We need to give them the opportunity to practice using evidence in the creation of robust arguments and to communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital forms. And that's where we are right now with the Common Core. And the road ahead of us is much steeper than the road behind us. Questions on that before we go into the next topic? Thank you. Um, any members have any questions for Dr. Chesson on, on that, any of that? Okay, we'll go on. Can you bring up the next poll? So the next thing is, so how are we going to assess this? Arlington is very lucky in that we have had common um, assessments, common formative assessments, and we've talked about this before um, for quite some time. And while we're required to have district-determined measures um, by the state, we want to have district-determined measures for us. But you'll see probably slightly less enthusiasm for district determined measures than the common formative assessments and I'll tell you why. So we're going to review the difference between those two and then I'm going to ask each um, curriculum uh, director to come up and talk about the district determined measures and the common folk, um, formative assessments in their subject area and then I'll just finish up briefly with the work that lies ahead. Common formative assessments which our teachers are doing very extensively is assessment for learning. It allows teachers to adopt instruction based on the evidence, evidence again, making changes and benefits that will immediately benefit student learning. Students can use that evidence to actively manage and adjust their own learning. And the feedback in an assessment is for learning occurs when there's still time to take action. And this is the measure of the highest interest for our teachers. They're very interested in this. I sat in on data meetings this week where people were talking about the DRA scores of students from the fall and the winter and the spring. There was a lot of conversation about how this can inform what students do over the summer and what they do in the fall. District-determined measures are used to make judgments regarding student growth over a yearly basis. They are required as part of the new teacher evaluation system. Um, the assessment of learning is, which is what happened on a, an annual basis, and it's most closely tied with the measurements that are in our goals for the district for SGP of 51 or better and uh, the PPI of 75 or better. And they were acquired by the state as part of the new teacher evaluation system. One of the hardest parts about this is that the um, state's directives as to what we need to be able to, do, oh, we need to be able to demonstrate where we are in the district um, have been changing significantly depending on the day. 
Um, but at this point, we're, we were marching in this direction, so they can change what we need to do, but we're gonna be ahead of the curve, and, and I think you'll hear that tonight. And I'm gonna start with um, grades K through five, and I'm gonna ask Linda Hansen to come up and talk about that. Hi, good evening, everybody. So we're gonna look quickly at um, elementary literacy. We'll start off with reading. And this is something you've heard of the DRA, the Developmental Reading Assessment, before. We don't have quite the right slide in here. We do have expectations for kindergarten at the winter and the spring benchmark. None actually when kindergartners come through the door, though. We give them a break for the first couple of months. But these are measures that, student, uh, that teachers understand really well. They know what they mean. They're diagnostic. They're helpful. They're very meaningful for teachers. So I would say that this is a common assessment that we've been using for a number of years in Arlington. But since we need to pick di uh, district determined measures for the state, this is one that we are going to pick at the K through three level because we can also measure beginning and end of year progress, whether or not kids have made a full year's progress in a year's worth of time. No matter where they start, we could still measure what a year from that starting point looks like. In writing, we are kind of bringing together a hybrid of the kinds of on-demand writing assessments that we have done in the past three times a year in the fall, winter, and spring. We're moving, we're, we're keeping that, retaining that writing on demand at the beginning and end of the year, but we're also um, introducing the collection of written pieces that are scored with the rubric after each unit of study in the Lucy Calkins writing program as we move further into the implementation of the Lucy Calkins writing. So what you see here is the on-demand writing prompt and we're gonna work on opinion writing. That's gonna be the focus this year. That was the type of writing that's the newest for teachers. We've been doing a lot of narrative. We do informational, but it was the opinion writing that really was new. So we're gonna focus on that this year. You can, what you see in terms of the units of study is where we have We've had a significant amount of experience in some of the units of study. Some are going to be brand new this year. So we're trying to do an in incremental approach and add bits and pieces each year. So the focus this year will be opinion writing. The following year, will be the focus will be on informational writing. Not that we're not going to do any informational writing this year, but the focus on the new approach and the new expectations will revolve around opinion this year and information writing next year. And I would call this a common assessment. It's diagnostic, it's keeping track of um, kids writing over time, but we will not be using writing as a district determined measure this year as part of our pilot. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Um, when we talk about um, the English department at the middle school and the high school level. We have had common assessments for a long time. In the middle school, um, the teachers get together three times a year. They give um, the writing assessment on certain days and then they have a day or two to work together to get them corrected, to look at the results, to figure out what those results mean and how then they need to change their instruction accordingly. In the high school, the common assessments work somewhat similarly, although we don't have as much time for them to work together. And in fact, for next year, we're actually, actually gonna structure time for them to, to sit down and actually work with each other um, around the common assessments. As it is, currently they, they um, trade information, things that they've learned, and they do it online, and they do it in brief meetings, but they need more time for that. So um, that's one of the things that we, um, we'll use some of the release time for next year in a more concentrated way. The district determined measures um, are gonna add to this whole sense of how students learn to write because we're going to give the same writing um, prompt at the beginning of the year and the end of the year based on something that we think the kids should be able to, to have accomplished by the end of the year. So um, in, in the middle school, we actually have um, some very nice, um, I guess, assessments um, that use 
pieces of video and pieces of nonfiction. The kids look at those on one day, make notes on them, and then the next day um, write according to a prompt, and then those things will be corrected um, with a rubric. Um, many of those, the skills involved in all of that are directly related to the Common Core. So we're looking forward to being able to assess where the kids are, let's say at the beginning of sixth grade, and then see how they've grown in those skills by the time they, they get through the year, and hopefully the teachers have, have addressed most of those things. So that'll be a very accurate way for us to, to see the growth um, that students have made. Um, and then at the high school, we, we're not as geared exactly to all of the common core um, requirements in terms of using media and using other elements because the writing that we tend to do in English classes is, is argument based but it often uses literature and sometimes uses various kinds of literature to compare and contrast and that's, the, that's what we'll be testing um, at the beginning of the year and again at the end, the same kind of thing. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, so um, as it is right now uh, for us, you know, the common assessments, the DDMs, I think there is a lot of crossover for math. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, for me anyways, avoid like assessment overload. So what I'm trying to do is actually intertwine the two and totally redesign what we're doing for our common assessments so that it actually has all the DDM stuff embedded inside of it. Um, so right now in, in K through five, we're a little bit more of the developmental stage because some of this stuff hasn't been there already. I would say all of our common assessments uh, at the elementary level are usually unit uh, assessments that don't really show growth because all you're doing is you know, summative assessments for the end of the chapter. So right now, uh, some of the work we're doing right now is just developing diagnostic tests. Our summer work is gonna be really fleshing out this entire system. For six through 12, uh, the next slide. This is what we're going to try to do, and this is a model we're going to hope to bring down to the elementary school, but we're much more uh, ahead of the game, I think, for the high school. Uh, our diagnostics, if I look at the f kind of uh, f common assessments we have, our diagnostics initially at the beginning of the year were always kind of basic skills. So we're going to totally revamp it uh, and try to embed some of this DDM concept inside. So we'll still keep the basic skills, and that's going to be part of the growth that we'll look at, how, how students are doing overall. Uh, there are certain things that I would consider foundational concepts that any course would need that you probably had from prior. That's going to be a big part of our anchor of, of growth. Um, how do they do with these core foundational ideas, let's say, before algebra that really tie to algebra so we can look to see how the overall concepts develop. Uh, the weird little twist is, we want to kind of maintain this idea of a formative assessment, so we're going to try to embed in that initial diagnostic also stuff that's for the first unit. So I'll use something like an Algebra 2 course. Uh, I think we're going to do a statistics unit as one of the first things for Algebra 2. So some of the ideas uh, in that initial diagnostic at the beginning of the year will have some statistics, so that way it's giving the, the teacher some data that they can use initially, some data where they can look for growth, uh, and data they can see for where the child came from. So we're just trying to milk this thing for a lot. Uh, Laura had talked about the fact that we have multiple content and process standards to deal with. So we're going to try to put an open-ended writing assignment. Um, then what's going to happen throughout the rest of the year is the mid-year exam will have components of the mid-year that looks back at your basic skills so that we can measure growth from there. It'll look back at the foundational concepts and see how well they did the, with the stuff that's relevant to that unit. Um, the, you know, the, the idea of a, an initial diagnostic, one at the beginning and one at the end of the year, like inevitably you can show a lot of growth if that initial diagnostic is all the stuff they're going to learn. So what I'm thinking of is more chunking it in like a first half and a second half and, and showing growth throughout. The last little thing we're going to kind of tie in, and this kind of goes with the growth of the overall writing and communication, that initial diagnostic will have writing at the beginning of the year, but then instead of trying to make every one of these big assessments so like huge, uh, at the end of the first term, there'll be another open-ended writing assignment. At the end of the third term, there'll be an open-ended writing assignment. So what we hope to do is to kind of look at the standards going through and then look at the writing and look at the communication skills going through. So we can just kind of uh, uh, 
hopefully have this as our overall structure. The, the teachers have been working on the diagnostic and they're coming up with really good things that they, they've used before and just kind of putting it together, um, which is kind of nice so far. Any questions? Hi, all. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll warn you, my second slide is, is missing, but I'll, I'll submit that later, um, and I can certainly talk about what was on it. Um, so I'll start with where we are now in social studies. We do have common assessments in place, um, and we feel very good about them. Um, we feel that they're actionable and, and allow us to, to intervene and, and help students who are struggling throughout the year and identify skills where there are strengths and skills where students need help. Um, we have unit-based common assessments in grade six. Um, we do an excellent nonfiction writing-based assessment six times over the course of grade seven aligned with each unit, but it is the actual same assessment, just the content that the students write about and the actual source that they use changes with each unit. And in grades eight through 11, we have three common assessments per year. Some grades actually have more, but we have a standard of three per year. Um, one is students applying a technology skill or a platform that they've learned in class um, and making a presentation, designing a website, that sort of thing based on content that they've learned in history class. Um, we do a thorough research process that culminates in the production of a thesis and research paper um, based on students' own research. And then we have a common final exam. So that's what we have in place now. Um, we'll be able to use some of that in the development of our district determined measures, but we do have to make a few changes. So I'll talk about what, what it will look like next year and going forward. Um, grade seven, actually, we're going to keep exactly the same. We'll use our first and our last of our nonfiction writing um, assessments as our, our two measures within a year. Grade six will be focusing on source analysis throughout the year and we'll use a first early sample and a late in the year sample of source analysis um, as our measurements. Grade eight, eight through 11, we're really going to focus on the umbrella of research skills and source analysis in all of our district determined measures. So um, what we do need to add and we're working on now is an early in the year grade level appropriate diagnostic to assess students' research skills when they enter the grade, and then we'll use the thesis slash research paper that students complete late in the year um, as the second sample measurement where based on a variety of measures that the teacher will look at in the paper, um, the teacher will be able to determine their, app, their skill at that point in time um, in meeting our, our research and writing goals. So let me tell you where we are with the common assessments. Um, we didn't have common assessments in my department prior to me beginning. So last year, we spent the entire year really developing what we wanted our common assessments to look like. And this year, we've piloted them. Um, so to give you an overview, in the modern languages, we decided to focus the three common assessments around the three modes of communication. So these are really crucial in um, foreign language study. You have interpretive communication, which is when you are faced with um, a resource like a radio announcement or a news article and you have to inter read and understand what it is that you're what you're presented with interpersonal communication is when you have basically a two-way exchange uh, conversation or email exchange with someone else and presentational communication is basically what I'm doing right now you've prepared a discussion or you've prepared an essay or a writing that you present um, and we also wanted to incorporate the four key skills um, in foreign language reading listening speaking and writing so that's essentially the way we have framed the common assessments um, and by focusing on really a skill and a mode of communication this is something we can track the progress of it's not very um, it's not based on sort of the discrete content it's a skill that can be tracked up the levels for the classical languages, um, which is Latin in our district, we focused on the tr skill of translation and reading comprehension. So that's where we are with the common assessments. 
Um, and I want to just report before I talk about our, the district determined measures, I actually spent the day um, in Marlboro at um, a DESC district determined measure anchor standard panel, uh, anchor development panel, it's a long wordy title, um, and I served on the French one to two um, a panel where we really were looking at the curriculum frameworks and coming up with anchor standards that could then be used to help districts develop the district determined measures. Um, and so the next step would be to submit exemplars to the state um, for them to vet. And I actually felt very, very good coming out of the meeting today. I feeling like that we were really addressing the standards that will be used as um, a, you know the anchor standards for the state. So I feel very confident about that. So the two district determined measures that we're planning to use for next year, um, we decided to choose the interpersonal communication and the presentational communication skill for the modern languages. So to give you an example, um, in let's say Spanish one, <coughs> the students have to have you know, basic conversation, hello, how are you, what's your name, tell me, you know, a little bit of, of about, information about yourself. Um, we have been filming these, we have rubrics that we've developed um, that really track the progress up the proficiency scales, so the rubrics are reflect the ACTFL, which is the American Council in the Teaching of Foreign Languages, proficiency scale going from novice to intermediate to um, low advanced. Um, so we have all five rubrics to kind of track the students as they go up um, in the levels. And then to jump up to Spanish three, the students are looking at a piece of artwork um, by like Dali or a famous Spanish uh, painter. And they have to have a conversation with each other and ask, what is your opinion of this based on what? So there is some bringing in of evidence, you know, what, where, what movement is this from or whatever. So the, the conversation becomes increasingly complex as the students move up. In the presentational um, assessment, we focused on writing. So they have an in-class essay. And it's really the same thing where at level one, you've got a very basic, you know, tell me about your family or about food that you like to eat. And then as they go up the levels, it becomes increasingly complex in terms of what they're able to write and report on, um, give evidence or give or give, make develop an argument on you know, X topic and you know, support it with whatever. So it really focuses on um, just this increase in difficulty on a very you know, a specific skill. So that's the overview. And very briefly, the, the classical languages for Latin, again, it's a translation. We have level appropriate passages. The students have to translate them. The Latin teachers also developed rubrics that reflect um, the skill as it progresses up in difficulty as the text move from um, I guess sort of leveled readers up into authentic Latin um, where, you know, with, it just becomes increasingly difficult for them to, um, to, interp to translate as well as with the reading comprehension. So that's it in a nutshell. Hi, thank you for letting us share our work with the staff and students with you. In the, in the science department, as Dr. Cheston said, there, there are two, two areas that we have to watch. There's content and there's, and there's practices. <clears throat> we are focusing on two areas of common assessments and, and district determined measures. They overlap to some extent, especially in the area of content. Although our common assessments tend to be more frequent and sometimes smaller. Than, than the uh, larger district determined measures that we are, are in the process of developing and, and utilizing. So in, in our first area of focus, we're analyzing pre and post testing data on uh, topical or, or longer periods of time. And we're trying to figure out where, where it's best to use smaller groups of time like a topical unit as our district determined measure and where it's best to use year-long assessment. And that's determined, in a sense, by us, by, by what the needs are. Each course is a little different. Each time of the school, uh, of the student's life is a little different. So we are choosing critical areas, topical areas, areas that show weakness, uh, areas that have special needs, and high needs, I mean, um, and some of these are, we're exploring and, and trying things like flipped classrooms and how to introduce questions that are, are long-term questions that, that's, that we can get some sense of what's happening to a student's understanding throughout the year by monitoring those questions and we're using that as a district determined measure. And then our second area of focus is on, on growth and 
as the Common Core, the, uh, the area of science has a newly developed framework called the Next Generation Science Standards. It's just come out a week, uh, month ago. And <clears throat> from that framework, the, Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts is now revising its science standards. And those will be finished in fall. And, I, and I've um, spoken with Dr. Bodie in the past <coughs> about, about coming, when those are finalized, coming and trying to uh, give an explanation of where they are and what they're all about. But those, the next generation science standards, in a sense, overlap with, with the ELA and Mathematics Common Core. It has practices, and, the, and a very significant overlap of those practices deal with creating arguments from evidence, being able to communicate and interpret scientific writings, knowing what the meaning of the data is, and, and so, we're basing our second focus of district determined measures on measuring that growth. It's, it's part of the Common Core, it's part of the next generation science standards. We are, are looking at um, kids' abilities to read and write about scientific articles. And recently, last, even as recently as last week, we, we are piloting some measures. <clears throat> we had our 10th graders involved in a biology symposium organized by our biology teachers, which student, all, all of the 10th grade biology students presented their findings on scientific readings that they had done. They synthesized their own report from reading multiple scientific papers and had to explain that to a panel of students and, and adults from the community. So the, the the kinds of skills that come out of that are things that we're trying to measure now with, with uh, a rubric base. And it could take the form of lab reports or scientific articles, and we're still exploring other possibilities. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. <clears throat> um, so you've heard from the five major subject areas, but the state requirement is that we have district determined measures across every educator. Um, we have one uh, district determined measure fitness gram uh, that's currently, uh, actually has been used for quite some time in PE. Um, we are in the process of creating and piloting um, two district determined measures in music, art, and health. Um, and we're in the process of creating and piloting uh, two district determined measures for the work of related service providers, such as um, guidance counselors and OT and speech and language pathologists. Um, I think that one of the things that's evident, but just uh, in addition to the fact that you've heard the same words over again, evidence, synthesized, analyzed, writing, um, using content, but not, not just knowing the content or learning the content, but using the content, is that these um, district determined measures came from the staff. Uh, we did not tell them what they should do. It came from the teacher level, and that is a very unique um, uh, way of handling this when we talk to other districts. And um, we still need to um, negotiate the final version of the district determined measures with the union, um, but I think that developing it from the ground up will really help us um, get buy-in from teachers. They're choosing the measures that they want to um, have their success be determined by. Um, so questions for myself or anybody else? Thank you. Um, why don't we start with uh, you can start. Okay. round robin? I'll start. Um, first, I want to make sure I've got the concepts right because it finally clued in. So the common assessments are like little tests that you do at any point and they just measure, do they know this or not? Uh, and then, yes. And then they inform the instruction, right. They may not be a test, but, they, but I get, yeah, I get yeah, what the yeah. point. I mean, yeah. it, it's a, a mm -hmm. test in the bigger, broader right. sense. Yes. Um, and then the district determined measurements are like a yardstick. You need a beginning and an end, and you're measuring what's in between. Right. And you want to know if you went all of 36 inches. Okay. You got it. Um, so then um, my second question is for subject areas which are assessed via the standardized tests, such as MCAS or, or uh, the New Park or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you plan to go back and see how the district determined measures correlate with what we find, what results we see on the MCAS? And can I just explain where I'm yeah, coming from with this? So 
as we roll all these valuations forward, part of what's rolled back with the calendar is that the district goals need to be set much earlier now. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to have the MCAS back at that point. Right. And so if we have robust information coming from the district determined measures, that is helpful. <laughs> Well, one of the things that will be helpful is that, and I'm going to ask Matt to come up here because he knows park more inside and out than I do, um, but that some of the park um, the measurements will actually be back much quicker than the MCAS, and if we do the park online, um, we're going to get almost all the results back by the time you want to set district goals. But uh, oh, okay. can you talk about the yeah. other? So um, the way park is structured is uh, right now there'll be an assessment three through, you know, certain level of high school uh, through 75% of the year as well as as close to the end of the year as possible. So the one that's the 75% of the way through the year will include some writing assessments, both ELA and mathematics. So what they want is that extra time to be able to grade those in between. So what they're saying right now is that you take the 75% of the way through, they have that little chunk of time to grade, you take the as far as the end of the year, once that's in, you should have all of your assessment data within a week. Wow. So as long as you're doing it online. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, it's a quick turnaround because the one at the end of the year is going to be all computer based. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be uh, person scored. Um, so, you know, people have asked, you know, 75 percent, can we get that back sooner? But it's not going to be until after the other one's done. So it's quicker than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for math, I could say one of the things that I'm trying to do with our DDMs is actually mimic what they're doing for park. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, we need to, it's, it's not a bad structure. You know, park in the long run, what they essentially would like to do is do an initial diagnostic, a mid-year exam, 75%, 95%. So you have this idea of the growth all the way through. But right now, the only two that are mandatory components are the 75 and 95% of the way through the year. Okay, thank you. Ms. Heim? Um, just to piggyback a little bit off of um, Dr. Alice Nampi, in terms of the um, measures, we're going to be having a beginning of the year to set that baseline. We're going to be having an end of the year. Um, I think one of the challenges in the past with some of our common assessments that we've had grade level is when they've um, assessed prior learning that's taken place before that year, um, so that determination of skill base, there's um, the um, temptation for teachers to actually go back to curriculum that actually was a previous year's curriculum because of the foundation. Um, I know for formative assessments, there's a certain amount where teachers need to address gaps before they actually can move on with new information. Where this is going to be tying into the evaluation, what safeguards are going to be in place to make sure that the teachers don't get so tied up in what the children are coming into their room with to begin with, that they're not actually spending adequate time on what the curriculum is for that year? Because there's no way we can assess every single component of what they're doing. So are, do I understand your question to be if at the beginning of the year, if I have a diagnostic, and then I realized that my students didn't learn everything that they learned the previous year that I would spend time reviewing as opposed to covering the new curriculum. Is that the question you're well, asking? That's part of the question, definitely. That's an age-old question in the sense that as a math teacher, there's always the temptation, um, you know, there was always the temptation to spend the beginning of the year reviewing thinking, well, they didn't get it, so I'm going to give it to them. Um, I'm going to you know, ask Mac to chime in if I'm incorrect, but um, there is so much material that has to be covered, and as we talked about, when, you know, those charts were very busy and I didn't go through everything from grades K through 8, but in order to be um, ready or close ready to algebra by 8th grade, if you take too many steps backwards, you're never going to take enough steps forwards. So I, I understand it's tied to the evaluation system, but I think one of the best things about that is that's why we've asked teachers to design these assessments and that we'll be also working with teachers to understand that that's only one piece of evidence that we're using and we'll be very clear about um, the reliant, the lack of reliance that we'll have on that. Um, we need to look at a, a, you know, a teacher's performance in, in a broader sense. And I think that that's going to be part of the trust thing. And that's what, that's what the whole educator evaluation system is based on trust and about discourse between evaluator and educator. And as long as we, 
you know, keep to that and keep building that trust, I think we'll avoid that. Um, but I do think that that was always a problem even before there was a district determined measure that teachers would say, well, they didn't learn this or that and, and try to go back and, you know, spend the first six weeks of school reviewing. And um, one other question, and it once again piggybacks off of one of Dr. Allison um, <coughs> some of some of the measures have been in place for a long time. There's a lot of evidence to support that they've been well developed. Um, we're, they're actually mapping to other tools that we've used and showing their validity. On the um, areas where there have not been, or grade spans where there have not been those measures, what um, ways are you going to have to normalize the data that you're getting from it and to make sure that it actually is an accurate assessment? Because taking that step back sometimes is a challenge when so much time has been invested in. Right, we need to make sure that there's a correlation to other measures that we see. So for example, in English language arts, if we have an assessment that shows that you know, a variety of students have gotten to a certain level uh, at writing and reading, and then we have the park assessment, and it doesn't match up, or uh, you, you, ha you have to take a grain of salt with classroom grades because there's so much involved in effort. A student can actually score, as we well know, very well on the MCAS, but not have good classroom grades, um, and vice versa, as a matter of fact. Um, so uh, we want to make sure th that, that we're looking at the same type of assessment. So that is why we will not be throwing our common informative assessments aside, and that information will also. So we have to look at the whole picture and put all those pieces of information together. It, I don't know that normed, I mean, the DRA has a normed database, sort of, but in some ways, because you can look at what an A1 is, but then again, an individual teacher does that assessment and so um, unless you were constantly calibrating it you know it, you, it there's some subjectivity that's involved and the same thing with any of these assessments except for the ones that are scantron so I mean I think we have to look at it in terms of all the other data that's there I, I don't know that we'll have it norm referenced um, in in this in the the strictest sense of the word ever. But we will be piloting it, we will be looking at these assessments and saying do they, does what we see make sense? And if it doesn't, then we'll have to talk about possibly changing the assessment. And, and forgive me because you may have mentioned this, is there the idea of actually pooling evaluation of student performance on the assessments? So um, the teacher that has those children is not necessarily the only one that's seeing seeing the open response portion or this or that. Absolutely, I mean that's one of the, that that's at the heart of a professional learning community um, to do cross um, grading and calibration grading. Um, and also at, at the elementary level they have an, um, we're talking about increasing the um, frequency of it, um, but they have regular meetings where they look at data across students altogether. So all those things will continue to happen. Thank you. So I wanna pick up on the point that Matt made about um, embedding the district determined measures in the common assessments. To what degree can we do that in other subject areas? You, you're going to do that in math? That's where we can, you know, I, I, just, that's what you're, I think yeah. almost everybody in the, att in the effort to try to not be constantly assessing yeah. um, and having assessment overload is, is going to try to do that to the largest extent possible. There's always some overlap with district determined measures and common formative assessments, um, and we go for the greater degree of overlap as makes sense. I mean, district determined measures tend to just be bookended, and so the common f we need more frequent assessments um, in order to know whether we need to change our instruction. Okay, so it's a goal of all the department heads to yes, try to. Yes, okay, it is. That, that's that's yep. that's what I want to understand. And what I mean, and and <clears throat> and also, so we have common assessments now aligned with the Common Core, and now that we did world language with in all subject areas, right? Uh, yeah, I should, they're aligned with the content of the Common Core. We, need, we are in the process of aligning our assessments with the instructional emphasis of the Common okay. Core. But that's pretty, I mean, that's, I think that's something you should all be very pleased yeah. with. I mean, that's, that's quite an yep. achievement. So, and I suspect that's ahead of a, several, many districts. Yes, yes. I mean, I would say that science, there will be possibly be some shifting because the next generation science standards just came out. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, yes. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'm, looking at, I'm looking upon this as really being a standards-based operation. 
that these district determined measures are really tied to standards and what mm -hmm. we're looking to do is align our assessments to standards and to really be tracking our students uh, to standards and one of the things that I'm really interested in is, is how we assess and report out the standards of mathematical practice I mean this this is new for teachers and parents to deal with and I'm wondering what we're doing to communicate that part of the standards to to our parents. Oh, yeah. it, I mean, well, it, I agree. I actually think that this is something that, not to make it a huge issue, that, that even Park and, and everybody is struggling with, is that these are habits. These are ways in which we want our kids to think. And you want to embrace that within the, the assessments. So the way I'm going to tackle it, the way I'm going to go for it is uh, with those writing assignments that are much more open-ended, mm -hmm. that do encourage, it does ask for the students to do, um, do the mathematics, but the certain qualities are going to be, uh, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking more of a holistic or qualitative rubric that we can actually look at what they're doing. Um, so we'll keep track of that. Uh, the next thing we have to do, and you're saying conveying this information, mm -hmm. you know, I could say for the elementary school right now, we have to totally revamp and redevelop what our report card is. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, in the way in which we collect our information, like for me, I want to reimagine how we convey this. I want to start to use the technology to, to you know, you, you kind of alluded to the fact that we're going standards based. I don't want to create a list of every single standard and say met, not met, you know, emerging. I'd like to do something a little bit more um, uh, consumable. Um, so for, for us right now, um, you know, we're, we're going to work on these writing assignments, work on things that are more holistic. We're going to create that rubric that really matches up with what we want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the elementary school specifically, we're going to start to work on this summer. Nadine Solomon, who's one of the elementary math specialists, and I are going <coughs> to work with some teachers, do some research, figure out what's out there. And then a bulk of next year, a good portion of next year, is going to be spent trying to design and, and create something that we feel pretty comfortable with that actually is um, you know, parent-friendly, uh, consumable-friendly, that, that people can read. And it's meaningful to them as well, because uh, I think that is a big issue. I don't have a, a great answer for you right now, but that's something that we already know we need to work on. Yeah, I, I think this is something that we're all in, in, in the business yeah. working on, and we've uh, started to incorporate some of the standards of mathematical practice right. into our elementary report card in Lowell. Yep. And, and, you know, it, 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 it's a journey, and we're looking at how it worked this year and, and, and what do we have to do to tweak it next year. But the statement that really caught my ear was that uh, uh, MCAS as an indicator does not necessarily correlate well with report card grades and, and, and because effort and, and other things that get mixed in there get in there and, and, and I'm a little uncomfortable with that because you know I, I've got to say that if what we're really stating is that students need to make standards that our grading system needs to reflect standards and not how pretty the cover is on the report or or, or whether the kid is a good compliant student within the classroom. I, I, I think that... Uh, I think you might have missed... Uh, what I'm talking yeah. about is that a student may not um, turn in a project or they may not turn in homework, and that's going to be reflected in their grade. But, however, when you give them a uh, mm -hmm. the MCAS, they may have mastered the standards for that grade level, and it may come across in their score. So does a kid who masters the content yet doesn't turn in the project fail the class. That's a longer discussion, I think, than we have time for tonight. <laughs> I mean, but that, I think that's the discussion that this is leading to. Right. Not, I'm not asking for the answer, but I'm saying this is a question that a, we need a, to be addressing yeah. and it's, be, it's, be a part of, because I think that as a district, we need to advance uh, into this area with our eyes open. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's certainly something we have to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> you got a Catholic school. Okay. Hey, quickly, guys, because we're running, we're running real late. Um, Ms. Starks, I, I don't want to. Add, no. Mr. Hader, I'd just like to thank you all, and without being nasty about it, this new talk in Boston about all this new technology that the uh, high tech people want to add to the uh, the whole curriculum and everything. They want everybody to take computer science from grade seven. But, yeah, but they should some of the it. stuff that I've been <laughs> listening to, they sound like they were, they're talking about redoing the whole thing over again, which is common with DESE, that once we get it working, they have to shuffle the deck again. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much for everything. Yes, and 
May, may I respectfully request that if the members come up with other questions, because tonight was so much in so little time for us to digest, can, may we may we submit questions to the superintendent Absolutely. or to the department heads or, yes. or CC yes. everyone? Yes, sure. That would yeah. be wonderful, and I'd love to see Linda. some of this. Yep, uh, I would love to see some of this come back to us during the course of this coming year, yes. this year of transition. And I forgot to introduce Linda Hansen, our AEA rep at the at the table here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I snuck in a little bit, I think, after you'd started your formal meeting. Since this is really the first meeting, I believe, that they, they've addressed district-determined measures in front of the school committee, I do feel the need to just kind of make a couple points here. One is that I do appreciate the work that Massachusetts has done. I feel like on behalf of educators and administrators and school committees to say one standardized test is not going to be the be-all, end-all that you're going to be measured against or that kids are going to be measured against. So we've come up with this thing, which is good in concept, called district-determined measures. It's never going to be a normed, standardized thing, nor should it be. If we think about the money, the time, the, the size, the population size, the expertise that the state has put into developing these standardized tests, we have that. So this doesn't need to replicate that. It should, it should mirror and match the standards, but it should be important and meaningful to teachers when you give these things can make all the difference of the world. We could give a reading test the first week after kids come back from summer vacation, and what you're measuring is summer loss, basically. If we take it two weeks later, we're going to get a different result. If we're going to measure kids at the end of the year based on that dipstick in the fall, it depends when you get it. My point is that I want us to really keep some common sense in all of this and just not think about it as needing to replicate. We have a standardized test, and we're going to have more. Park, I actually think that someday, Park, if we get into these 75%, 95%, they're even talking about mid-year writing samples earlier on. If we have one comprehensive set of assessments, we don't need to mm -hmm. replicate that. We need to understand why, what the purpose is that we're using these other parallel assessments for. Um, and also just the measurability of it. I know teachers are really concerned about what does a year growth look like in terms of research skills or an on-demand writing prompt? What does a half year of growth look like? So cohort size, are we measuring year over year? Are we tracking one cohort through, you know, as they go up through the grades? So I just feel like this is a really um, intricate, exercise that we're all going to be entering in on and I just want us to go in thoughtfully and to keep doing kind of a, a gut check on making sure it makes sense for kids and for teachers. So. All right well thank you Dr. Chesson. Thank, thank you everyone, uh, Thanks, all our department heads, thank you very very much. Okay, so we are moving on to uh, approval of the school calendar for 2013-2014. Would uh... Uh, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this has been a very collaborative effort, and certainly a lot of input from all of you been doing moving forward with this. One of the things, just to put the, again in perspective, what we've been trying to do is to be. Uh, much more ahead of where we've been in the past. Before, we didn't even get conferences on the calendar until the fall. And what we felt was very strongly is that we really needed to have a calendar at the end of the year where people knew where, what the, where the early release days, professional day, vacations. Now, the major things we've we did back in December. What we have been looking at very carefully is how we're going to be able to do all the professional development we need to do next year, which is extensive. And I think you get a sense of that here. And this is just part of the whole picture. There's so many other initiatives and mandates that are being uh, uh, required of us. So we also were listening to parents, particularly elementary parents, who were concerned about the number of early release days. And last time we told you we had brought the number from 13 <coughs> down to 11, and that was the number sticking in our head. In that time frame, feedback we had from the principals of the elementary schools was, and feedback from their teachers, 
because they were actually counting it up. If I have 25 kids in my class and I meet with parents for 20 minutes at conferences, I need so, many, so much time. And the time that we had allotted was insufficient, particularly if a teacher had a large class. And we have some classes next year that will be 28 students. So the elementary principals asked us if we would also include elementary in one of the conference days that we had designated for middle school as well, which actually brings it up to 12. Now, we had told you, we had told you we would try to stick to 11, but that's why it changed. Now, if you want to reduce one of the early release days for elementary, you know, that would be your prerogative. But I will tell you that we have, Laura, Dr. Cheston has worked with the, uh, with our curriculum leaders and with principals around all of what we need to be able to fit in next year, and it's tight. We could use even more than we have, but on the other hand, it's always a balance between, you know, what we could use and what is reasonable for families. So with that little sort of overview of this, I want to get, turn, the, turn this over to Laura, who is, we have a, a, a calendar here, um, and you saw both versions of it, one which did not have the November 19th and one that did. but. Laura, do you want to? I, I just want to add, and not because I know we're running late, around, uh, late but we have um, 12 days for elementary, as we said, uh, Dr. Bodie said. Two of those are conference days. Two days are for um, work for the teacher on the new teacher evaluation system. That leaves us the remaining days to be split up three days to math, three days to common core literacy one day for science and one day for social studies. So science and social studies are really getting the short end of the stick. Um, but, and, and that's gonna be very difficult when we have the new generation science standards, but it's also more difficult because as we look at the Common Core for uh, standards for literacy, as you heard tonight, those are not just for the reading and writing and the literature that has to do with the, the vanilla literacy, um, but science <coughs> has literacy standards in them. Social studies have literacy standards in them. So if we have to cut back that one day, um, then we're going to be forced with the choice of where is that going to come from. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it can't come from the conferences. Certainly it, it cannot come from the new teacher evaluation system. So that means that we're going to have to look at the core four subject areas in order to say that they would not have a half-day professional development day. And, and and to be realistic, they they get out you know at one. It's not like they really have a, a whole full day. They have a, a chunk of time, and it's a good chunk of time. And we're very grateful for that time. Um, but as Dr. Bodie said, we could really you know have used more. But we're happy if we could get the twelve. Questions for the superintendent or Dr. Chesson, Bill? The professional development day that you have, I'm looking at. I think it's on both. Yes, uh, in November. We talked about it before. I, I see that you have two teacher days prior to the school year starting. That's correct. Why wasn't that either put at the beginning or at the end, at, after the students uh, leave? Instead of, instead of November uh, 1st. 1st, thank you, uh, have it f uh, June, for right now, June uh, 19th. Well, the, the the purpose of the professional day um, at that time of the year, which I, I think that there's a universal um, feeling that this is a really um, uh, a timely place in this because we are able to um, have a whole variety of opportunities for our teachers. One of the things that I think we need to do among many next year is to have time for um, our PLCs to be have, to working on their team goals and have a chunk there. We need to have more technology workshops. That's the time, once you get your year established, you're, you're ready to look at, um, and, and you're getting to that point, it's time to look at other ways that you're going to be sort of mapping the rest of the year, year out. The end, certainly a professional day at the end of the year would be terrific for other reasons. Um, the, the first two days, how, that, the, how those work by contract is that half of the day is district determined 
and half of it uh, is for teachers to have in their classrooms to prepare. Um, we, we, this year, instead of having an opening day speaker, because our need is so great uh, for curriculum overviews, we're, we are going to start with a, a convocation of sort, but it's going to be very, it's going to be very time limited, so we can give almost the entire morning to grade level and department level time to go over the work that's done this summer. Day two of those early days are given to faculty meetings at each one of the schools. And they use that. We have a whole array of mandates that have to be, we have to go through every year um, in terms of trainings around FERPA, for example. So all of that happens the second day. And that's how those first two days are used. Um, well, let's go around. Um, Jeff. Uh, you know, we've discussed the calendar a lot. And I, <clears throat> I support the, um, the professional development days that we have. Um, I'm always concerned that there, there is not enough time to do adequate professional development. Uh, it's just, but I think we should um, adopt the uh, calendar. So I'm just going to move approval of the calendar so it's on the uh, draft second. Day or B. Okay. Draft day or draft day is the one that has the November 19th draft date day. in it. Draft okay. day. <coughs> Was there a second to draft day? Okay. Second. Further discussion on that motion. Um, <coughs> Ms. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Anthony, I saw you first. I'll vote for it, but with reluctance because I feel that this is a burden on our families, mm -hmm. and I'm still hoping that we can come up with some other alternatives. Ms. Hine. Um, I was just going to point out that whenever I've been part of professional development, there's always been this discussion about the need for teachers to go back to their classroom the next day and implement it immediately. And that's how districts provide effective professional development to allow it to become embedded and not ask people to remember it over the summer or not be able to try it out right away because they're busy getting kids settled into a new routine and schedule and don't really start instruction for you know a week later and so while this is challenging for our families given i think given our responsibility to provide good professional development for our staff and the benefits it gives to our students when the teachers are given additional opportunities to expand their knowledge and integrate into their classrooms um, this is the least detrimental to the timeliness of instruction and is going to provide the most opportunity for it to be worthwhile. Anyone else? Uh, vote. Mr. Hanna? I'm going to vote for it also, but I think we've, we spend an all, awful lot of time discussing this several meetings during the year. I think it's it would be good for us to look at the calendar and come up with some creative ways to meet the teacher needs, the professional development needs, and the parent needs. I don't know if it can be done, but I, need, I think we should spend more time out of meeting doing this. Thank you. Okay, I just want to echo a couple of words from my colleagues and add a couple of my own. Uh, Dr. Ampey, I couldn't agree more. Uh, over the course of this last year, I heard so much in the way of parental um, concern, aggravation with the breakup of our year. Um, I look at 2013, 2014, and I see EMS and ECR, right? These are two conference dates. Um, Friday the 6th of December and Tuesday the 10th of December okay so for a working family to do an 1115 on a Friday and then the following Tuesday back-to-back -back weeks I think that's really really hard and um, in terms of professional development 12 early release for that teacher eval two days could we not have some sort of teacher eval study over the summer I mean these are teacher eval um, professional development, I mean, I'm sure can be done on an individual basis too. I'd love to see next year something in the way of, as Mr. Hainer was suggesting, some sort of more creative out of the box thinking, see a survey. I want to see, uh, the principals say their teachers need the professional development. I want to see the teachers on the ground in the classrooms say, we need 13 days where we're going to uh, do early release. I'd love, to, I'd love to see some type of survey, some, some teachers come in here and say this is absolutely necessary. Um, because this is really hard. This is really hard for, for, for me to approve. I will, I will vote yes on this. I think it's important the school committee come down and say, this is our school calendar. It's important for, for, the, for the public out there to know that we're voting on this tonight. 
uh, with respect to high school graduation. It is a change. I want everyone to know that there's going to be a change to high school graduation from Sundays, where they were customary, to a Saturday. And this was sort of brought on, and, and I don't know how this developed. You know, what was the genesis of that? You know, who was called in to think about doing that? Um, so there are a lot of changes here, and for the second straight year, there's going to be 13, 12 plus 1, 12 early release and one pro pro professional development day, 13 days where, there, where there's going to either be no school or early release. And I'd love to see 2014, 2015 calendar where it downgrades a little bit because we're not going to be in a year of transition. We're not going to have to deal with a new teacher eval system and a common core system. It will already have been implemented. So I'd love to see a little bit more um, creativity and less breaks in our day and our year for, for working, working families. So, that said, uh, all those in favor of the 2013-2014 draft day school calendar say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Kara, 7-0. Thank you. All right, we will get this up on the website so people can have that. <coughs> Thank you. Moving on. Uh, approval of data assistant job description. Okay, well, this is a position that was, uh, it, it is in the budget for uh, this, uh, this current uh, fiscal year, this next fiscal year. Um, based on the needs of all the data needs in the district and the move to central registration, um, our director of, uh, of data has a lot of data responsibilities right now, lots of reports that have to be, be done, and has taken on the role of central registrar for the district as well. So she has asked, and we have felt that there's a need for um, some part-time support down there. This would be an assistant, an administrative assistant position, 20 hours a week. This would be a unit C position and um, would uh, be posted in accordance with the unit C contract and um, are looking for someone who is, you know, has some data experience, who is, has good technical skills, um, very precise, detail-oriented, um, and can uh, work with the director of data to accomplish all the, the reporting that needs to be done all, and um, the central registration. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'm going to move approval. Second. Okay. Discussion? Mr. Hanna? Quick question. Is this person under unit C? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Oh. Um. <laughs> Sorry. I'll catch you next time. What? Do, do you have something? I, okay. I did have Dr. a question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I don't see anything about um, confidential data that isn't the stuff that they're dealing, I mean, should that be mentioned in the job description or just a recognition that the data, that the data is, is confidential? Yeah. yeah we, we could add that. Um, um, isn't that there under item number six? <clears throat> okay, sorry, I missed it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. You okay, never mind. All right. Cool. Everything? Okay. okay, everyone, all right. Um, moving on. Did we, did we have some goals? We did vote. Okay. Okay. District goals, 2013-2014, our second reading and uh, a vote to approve these goals. Dr. Bowden. Um, the committee spent quite a, quite a lot of time at the beginning of this year looking at overarching goals. And as we look to next year, um, We've had a lot of discussion at the table both, and we've had a lot of discussion at, with the administrative team as to what would be the, uh, the, 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 fo the major foci of next year. And I think that the goals that uh, you see here that we, we've talked about it more even in, in, during retreat uh, reflects the efforts that we, the, the primary efforts. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of other things that are going to be happening. Um, but that we want to particularly focus on. As far as, as my particular goals for next year, we'll, ha we'll discuss those in December, but they, they represent um, elements of, of many of these goals. Okay. Do we have a motion on the goals? Move to approve the goals. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. I just have one quick minor point on the bottom. It says district goals 2012 2013. Can we get rid of that? Mm hmm. Um, that was a little, confusing. a little mistake. Um, discussion? We went over these a lot in retreat last week. 
Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, carries, 7-0. Thank you, Dr. Bode. All right, you are on again. Superintendent's report. Good, well, I'm glad we, we picked up some time in these because I actually have a fairly long report. <laughs> it's good. Um, at your places tonight, you have the final report of the visiting committee for NEASC. And we're going posting that on our website and as well as distributing it with the, um, the high school staff. I do not intend that this is the meeting that we're talking about the NEAS report. Um, we, are, we are going to need to have a separate meeting, um, perhaps this summer, and certainly this isn't it's something that we're going to be discussing over probably many meetings as we go forward. But it is rather just simply to um, mention a few, go looking at the report, looking at a few of the highlights, and then you can have some time to sort of read it more, uh, more thoroughly and I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of uh, questions. And at that time, we'd certainly want to invite the high school principal and our curriculum leaders and, and also the, uh, the other administrators in the high school to come and, and be part of that discussion. So this is really a very uh, limited overview of where we are with this. Um, for those that are listening who are not, may not be familiar with what NEASC is, NEASC is an independent uh, accrediting agency. It's called the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And they, we are a member of that association. And as part of our membership, they come and do an assessment in a number of categories uh, and with regard to the number of standards every 10 years and once that report is issued then there is also follow-up during the course of that 10 years. This represents the 10-year visit and what they found that the team visited in December. Um, there was late spring a draft report that, that you always do that it's part of the process draft report that we respond to and then an, a final report is issued. And then after that, there'll be a, a period where they will, they'll have us a, a summary letter of their, mm -hmm. uh, their standing relative to the report. So there, in you, and when looking at the report, um, there are a number of standards. There are teaching and learning standards um, that look at core beliefs. They look at curriculum. They look at instruction. And then after that, uh, they look at resources, school culture, resources, and, and basically the community. So I thought I would just go through a couple of the highlights of these, um, looking at the overarching category of teaching and learning standards, which um, looks at um, core beliefs. And if you want to refer to this, this is on page 18 of your report that you have, at your, have, you, you have there. And how you have a, how the or report is is organized? It has a narrative, and then at the end of each one of the sections, they'll have commendations and recommendations um, that that are given. And it's going to take some time to read through this to have a sort of a, a, a get a full full understanding of it. But for example, in the commendations for this particular uh, standard, that the identification, the accommodations of this is one of many, of six of them. The identification of a set core, set of core values, which is the I care, and you've heard that mentioned here in this room before, that are embodied by the vast majority of students and staffs, and it positively impacts the culture of the school. And there are other accommodations in that line as well. Um, one of the recommendations for um, the school in that regard is to implement a plan to regularly review and update the core values, beliefs, and learning expectations. So that's the, type, the nature of that particular standard. If you turn to page 23, this is in that broad category, again, teaching and learning. This is about curriculum. And there are six commendations and five recommendations in this section, again, preceded by a narrative. But for example, a commendation is that the Arlington High School staff is committed 
to providing high quality curriculum to all of its students. And further down in another one, it says they have authentic learning opportunities through community service and the capstone project, as well as physical education and wilderness, survival and wilderness camping. A recommendation, oh, there's five of them, that they would establish additional time for collaboration and ongoing work necessary to maintain 21st century standards and curriculum. And actually some of that we're talking about with respect to calendar, how do you find that time um, to have that level of collaboration in a high school? So those are challenges that will face us. Um, when you move on to the instruction uh, section for teaching and learning, page 27, Accommodation, and you've heard a little bit about this tonight, the use of evaluations by administrators to ensure that instructional practices are consistent with the school's core values, beliefs, and 21st century learning expectations. What is part of the learning culture and teaching culture of the high school are, are consistent, common assessments to measure um, the student learning. What we're moving to is a, a different form of that, which measures sort of the yardstick of what's learned in the, in the course of one year. Um, they talk about the engagement of students as active and self-directed learners through a variety of research-based instructional techniques. And the com faculty is committed to a high quality inst instruction. Um, in recommendations, for example, in this section, they talk about ensuring that all teachers have equitable access to modern technology and appropriate training to enhance its instructional practices, hence the professional learning day, because <laughs> that's an ideal time for that. But we also do a lot more with technology than that. But again, it's, it's um, as you increase technology, increase technology integration, it also really increases the need for professional development. If you turn to page 36, Again, in the teaching and learning assessment uh, uh, section, this is on assessment. One of the accommodations for assessment was that a wide variety of assessment strategies, including formative and summative assessments, um, in order to revise and improve curriculum and instruction used by teachers. So it's a commendation that this is happening. Um, a recommendation, again, to the um, time issue, provides sufficient formal time for teachers to collaborate in the creation, analysis, and revision of formative and summative assessments. So you get the sense of, if there's a, uh, in this broad category, there are, there are um, a variety of commendations and recommendations. And again, this is not meant to do an in-depth look at this, but rather to look at how it's set up and just calling people's attention to it and letting them know that they can look at this online. Now, that's the teaching and learning. If you look on page 38, this will give you an outline of what the support standards are. And there are three support standards, school culture and leadership, school resources for learning, and community resources for learning. Um, if you look now at page 45, this is on school culture. There are, there are 11 commendations and six recommendations. Mm -hmm. A commendation, for example, is the existence of a positive school culture which makes Arlington High School a safe and welcoming place for students and staff. And they also mention the impressive array of extracurricular clubs and organization. The exceptional demeanor and deportment of students in the school indicating a respectful and supportive school culture. They also comment on the, the lack of barriers to general student enrollment and core and elective courses. And the leadership and initiative demonstrated by teachers essential to the improvement of the school. In a recommendation, that they want to ensure that, that uh, research-based instructional strategies and teacher collaboration are supported by the school schedule. Again, coming back to this issue of time. And um, 
implement a way to address overcrowding in classroom se settings in which the use of lab and studio equipment presents potential safety hazards. All right, so moving on to the next support standard, resources for learning on page 52. Uh, one of the commendations on this is a, uh, the comprehensive array of academic, social, and emotional support programs and services available to assist students in meeting 21st century expectations. Um, a recommendation is to assure the availability of language appropriate materials for assessing and placing ELL students, and that's something we've talked about at, at this table as well. So again, you get the sense of there were eight, there were eight commendations and um, two recommendations in this section. Now I really want to call your attention to page 56, which is the community support uh, standard. And uh, this theme is echoed through in the commendations, recommendations. And I, I just want to read this statement. Um, Quality instruction is being delivered by teachers in spite of the impediments of a crowded and deteriorating building. Although students and teachers have pride in the programs at Arlington High School, the advanced age of the building shows significant signs of wear and tear. Science labs are not sufficient in size or design for some classes that have larger enrollments. Columns and posts in rooms obstruct student vision and movement. A little bit further down, it says classrooms are insufficient in number and size, especially in science and art classrooms, where class size exceeds the number of available stations in some classrooms. Students are able to achieve educational goals and objectives in spite of a facility with significant needs. Mm -hmm. And if you turn to page 58, um, that sentiment is echoed again in the commendations and, and, and certainly in the recommendations. In this section, it's the reverse. <laughs> we have four commendations and ten recommendations. Um, Six out of the ten deal with the building. With the building, right, right. So we, we certainly need to have a follow-up discussion at this table. There's implications for a whole array of things in terms of support and time and uh, teaching and learning, and certainly the building itself. So this is something that we will do. It's, it's going to be um, something that probably will be in many ways in our meetings over the next, over the next year, really, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of issues here, and we might want to focus on, we'll have to think about how we want to focus on this, if we want to take it by standards or a couple standards at a time, mm -hmm. uh, and do it that way. So, Mr. Right. I, I just want to say, going, you know, I, I read through this kind of stuff all the time, and I want to say that on one level, this is one of the most exemplary reports that I've seen, because when it comes to the heart and soul of teaching and learning this building, they are commending the teachers, they are commending the administration, they are commending the students, uh, and when you look at the recommendations, those are sort of the uh, excellent to exemplary kind of recommendations, the thing that will really move us to, to the very top of the field. I mean, the, they're not describing things that are wrong, they're sort of pointing us to the next steps to get better, and you could hear some of those steps being discussed earlier uh, in the measures. But on the flip side, it is highly critical of the facility that we are unable to meet the needs of our students uh, with our facility, that the teachers are really going the extra mile to provide this high quality education as that sentence you read, despite the fact that the facility that they're operating in is, is a definite drawback. And uh, reading through this, I can't imagine being accredited 10 years from now unless we have a significant uh, improvement in the facility that we're offering for our students. Mm -hmm. All right, so you need time to read it and we'll come back to it for sure. All right, um, some uh, administrative announcements. As you know, this, we have a number of retirements um, and openings in, in key administrative positions and, and or also support position. And 
One is our attendance officer and court liaison. Which, uh, we met in executive session with Ellen Digby, who has just done a phenomenal job in that role. Um, we had, in all of these cases, we had search committees, and, and, and I will have to say the quality of candidates was really impressive for all of these positions. And um, um, after a, a very thorough search, um, I have uh, offered the position to Cindy Sheridan, and uh, she has accepted that position. And Cindy has comes to us from having been one of the was was the program director for the diversion program when it first started in the Arling, in Arlington. Lucille Nicholson, who is our director of nursing, is also retiring, and this is a very a key position in the district. Um, we had two very strong uh, internal candidates, and that position has been offered and accepted to Sue Frankie, who just, by the way, received her doctorate. Oh, wow. Yeah, very impressive. And again, we, for the athletic director, we had a very, uh, again, a, uh, quite a search, and we had um, a number of really strong candidates, and that position has been offered and accepted to Melissa Lu... L Dul yeah, so the G is silent, <laughs> and the L is silence. Lou Lecky. It's spelled <laughs> D-L-U-G-O-L-E-C-K-I. And up. Uh, the press release went on. The press release went on that one already. Yeah, yeah, we won't be doing press release in the others, but I thought you would know that because they are somewhat key positions in the district. All right. Thank you. Um, today, and I want, we had our annual st staff recognition day, and I want to thank those of you that were able to come and to thank uh, Mr. Pierce for coming and giving a very, actually, uh, really lovely uh, talk, mm -hmm. uh, talking about some of the, uh, get, reading the lyrics of one of the songs in Rent, which was so appropriate to the work that they do. But we have a number of just wonderful people retiring, and um, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the program so that you can see that. But this is one of our most, uh, I should say, cherished events of the year where we recognize the people who have a milestones in the district, the 45-year, 35-year, 20-year. We also recognize that, that the people, the teachers who have made professional status this past year, because that, we feel that that is something worth celebrating. And then also this year, with Linda and I thinking this through, we, we really wanted to have a district-wide acknowledgement of the, the people who are retiring, and we did that today. Um, but one person I just want to bring up, because this is so unusual, uh, one of our staff members who did retire this year, uh, Nancy Ortwine, 45 years mm. of service in the Arlington Public Schools. That really is quite unusual. And the next person down that was retiring was Peter Rufo at 35 years. So it's a, it's... We have had people occasionally get into those 40s, and, but uh, not many. All right, and uh, also with respect to graduation, we graduated our class this year, and um, what an outstanding class. Mm -hmm. Great speeches, um, and uh, I think that you've seen the Ponder Report, and you can see where all of our students are going, and it's a very impressive array of colleges that they've been accepted into, and a more complete report will be coming out of the guidance department and talking about the percentages of first choice, second choice, that type of thing. But again, I want to thank members of the school committee for coming, because your presence really um, signifies the, the, um, the level of importance of this event. And again, thank you to Mr. Pierce for his, his speech this year. We did hear some feedback last year about sound, so we went and we hired a company to come in for sound, and while people couldn't hear last year, now they heard like three times. <laughs> and you're standing at the microphone, you could hear each word being said twice. It was a little disconcerting. So that's now we have to work on that piece of it. But it was um, it was a beautiful day, and uh, congratulations to all of our our graduates, and congratulations to the parents in this town for. Um, for, their, for supporting these students in their success. It's been our pleasure and really privilege to teach them for the years they've been here. Um, 
we had another little, um, it's not little, but a, a recognition of our music department. There is a magazine in Boston called the Bostoniano Magazine. And they, had a, they featured uh, two of our music teachers and, and our students in the Pops concert this year, which was, I have to say, rather extraordinary, where they had music that was playing to movies. It was a very high-tech kind of concert. But just a quick, they had a quick quote in there, but they really were commenting how flawlessly the students played. And that's really such a compliment to the, the, the discipline and the inspiration that our music teachers give them, as do our other teachers as well. Um, so congratulations to them. And also I wanted to acknowledge Mary Villano, who this week was given an award from the Rotary Club uh, for person of, Community Person of the Year, and uh, well-deserved. The Rotary Club, as you know, is really focused on service. And uh, there were a lot of people that were honored this year who have given extraordinary service to, to Arlington. But I, I, I believe the reason they acknowledge Mary Villano is, is the work that she has done in her years here in Arlington. She's been here for 32 years and has had many roles. But one of the things that has been true about her work in the school from day one has been her, her devotion and work toward involving students in community service and learning how to be a service in their school, um, how to learn to be parents. One of my first was having seen the dolls that the students were, were have, were, would be carrying around the, the school, um, learning to be parents and what it meant to have a child and, and not to leave the child there somewhere where you went off and did something else. And I know that Mary offered in many occasions to babysit these dolls, but it's really a, an interaction with the students, inspiring them to understand that they, to think beyond themselves and to think about how they can be of service to, uh, their, to their friends, to their school, to their community. And she was exemplified that in her years here. So that was a well-deserved honor, and um, of course, I've been getting emails about class sizes mm -hmm. already. And I know this concern. Um, I'm gonna. I will be sending to you uh, where we where we where we are at this point. But I have to tell you, while we look at the numbers rolled forward to next year, it is in state of flux. It changes all the time. You know, we get a We get five registrations one day, and then we get two the next. And it's just been going on like this now for several weeks. And so the numbers have been changing, and, but they change both ways. We have students withdrawing and coming in. But I will say, looking ahead already, we're, we're seeing class sizes as a norm in the elementary, getting in that 24, 23, 24, 25. But we do have some class sizes that are going to be 27, 28 next year. And uh, we're going to be watching these class sizes very carefully over the, the, the this summer, I know already grade three at Stratton and Thompson, we have class sizes that are at the 27, 28 in grade three. That's not to say that they will stay there. They may not, but they also may grow. And so we're gonna have to be watching that. What is of, con of concern though, with respect to that in our budget, as you know, we had two uh, reserve positions in the budget and um, we've already had to put one of those reserve positions um, at Stratton because their kindergarten, which we predicted to be no more than 50, is now 60 and growing. So that's what's happening, and uh, we'll have to just keep you apprised as, as to where we are with all of that. And the last thing is, as you came in the door, you saw all of those yellow tape around the, you're probably wondering what's going on. Maybe not, but what's going on is that we're putting cutaways in there for the, the door. This has been on the agenda for all year. It's just, it just was like, when did that come up on the, the, the list? The, the handicap accessibility with the buzzer, all of that was put in a long time ago. 
but we, we need to get cutaways there so that the, the people can come up. And what's going to happen now across from those cutaways is those thir first three places, mine's one, um, will be made into handicapped um, places. And the one down by the, the auditorium will no longer be a handicap because that's going to be the, the point of access. But that's why you, you see it there. Hmm. All right, so that's, that's my report tonight. Thank you. Um, are you ready to, to move on to the next one, the Thompson rebuild update? Well, we since the last <coughs> meeting, we really haven't had um, another meeting. Well, we, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. And we're still on target. And we're at the point where the last floor is being laid. That, that took a little bit longer than we thought they were going to be. But right now, the, the, the time frame is still that we're going to be substantial completion on July 12th. And at that point, uh, we'll still be punch lists. The punch list will go into August. We expect furniture to start to be delivered in July, though the first date is sometime early August. What we're trying to do is to get the school, at least for technology, set up by the time we do Tech University, mm -hmm. which is the second week of August. We really want the Thompson teachers to be in their building using the technology then. And so that's, what, that's why this uh, substantial completion date is so important, because there's other things that need to happen in order for the technology to be ready to go. So, so far, I, I haven't seen anything to the contrary since our last meeting. Jeff, did you want to add anything uh, to this? Well, we're, we're looking at dates for dedications. Ah, uh, yes, thank you very so much. People, people yeah. should say. Well, there are two dedications. One is dedication for the building itself, a ribbon cutting. And uh, we've contacted MSBA, and basically they're, they're just saying to us, well, let us know when you want to do it, and we'll have somebody there. I guess it's fair to say I have not, we've been trying to mine all the calendars everywhere to see if there's any conflict on the 15th of September, which is a Sunday. And so far, nothing. It's my wedding anniversary. Okay. <laughs> this will be a good way to hey, celebrate. Cancel it right. That's gone. So it's right there. So wedding anniversary. Wedding anniversary. We didn't want it on. It's town, day. town Day weekend, which is the next weekend, the next right. Saturday. Also. It's not usually it's that weekend, but it's not this year. And the reason why, because one of the Jewish holidays is on Saturday. Um, but also, we have the dedication of the library, mm -hmm. Bill Chase, on the 29th of September, and there's already an author that's coming, so we need that ahead. But I also think the community is going to be could hardly wait to come in and see the building, mm -hmm. and so I think. The 15th works, and so we're going to get those out. We have a, we'll have a lot to have to do with invitations and what the, what the ceremony is going to look like and inviting the community to come in and see the school and have tours. I, we, I think it'll be fabulous. Well, we're not clear on the time yet, sometime in the afternoon. We don't, it'll be in the afternoon, definitely in the afternoon, two-ish, something like that. Th th those details, it was really getting the date that was the tough That's part. A, well, and, I, and I feel even a little bit... Should I say it? Because is it definite? And I, I, I think it's like right there because I have not had any, um, mm -hmm. any pro anybody say, no, we can't do it then. Mm -hmm. So, so it it'll be speaking? up and running and have students and people will be oh, going yes. to class before you do the dedication. Oh, yes. The, okay. the students start back on the Tuesday after Labor Day. Okay. Just so checking. they'll have two weeks in the building. Uh, which uh, it's better. We originally thought maybe the eighth, but that's just too soon. Um, a lot of people have a chance to sort of get in the building, get a little bit settled, maybe even have some student work up. But people are really just going to wanting to come in, not so much see the student work as they really want to come in and see the building. Mm -hmm. Anything else on rebuild from the members? Yeah. Thank you very much. For that update. Um, in terms of us and needing a, a meeting perhaps in August. I don't know. We, we should talk about this before we all split apart for the summer. But given that we're going to have a new school up and running on, on right after Labor Day, we might want to schedule a meeting at the school committee in August to talk about any potential issues that might arise between now and then on the Thompson. Okay. We'll talk about that. Yeah, well, we can have a, we can have a 
a tentative one set up because the first meeting you're going to have is the 13th of September. 12th. 12th of September. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a Thursday. Right. But it would be before the um, the groundbreaking. But there'll be more communication in terms of what you know your, your role and what's going to happen, all of that. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, monthly financial report. <coughs> You have the um, monthly tracking reports. Um, I was able to, to delay the creation of these reports because of the date of this meeting mm -hmm. to capture the second to last payroll of the year. So we're pretty spot on <coughs> where we expect to land. Um, and we, have, we, ha we had a small amount of savings, um, roughly 250. I, I won't know until the last payroll hits next week exactly what our total savings amount out of which we're going to be able to do some year-end um, uh, technology purchasing and some curricular mm -hmm. supplies as well. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, and it may be just my interpretation as it usually is, but on page two of three. Um, the budget tracking report? Yes, I'm sorry. 83201, tuition to other schools. Yes, that is, uh, I have not yet done the journal entry to the circuit breaker account, and that's where you see the negative balance there. Well, it's not so much the negative balance. I'm looking at this, the second column. From everything else above, the second and third column usually add together, and you end up getting the fifth column. Am I correct? Right. The reason this is different is because I have elected to keep the tuition expenses in the, the in the general fund appropriation until the very last minute because I find that trying to manage how much we're spending in tuition when I have the expenses scattered out in multiple places is just inefficient. Okay. So, you know, the budget, when you look at the budget book, we budgeted about 6.2, I believe, 6.2, yeah, 6.3 for FY13. I'm sorry, the FY14 numbers have superseded it at this point um, in my brain. Um, but the amount of that that was coming out of the appropriation was the 4683677 you see in the first column. The reason the expenditures are so high is because I have both all the expenses, that's the next column, and all the encumbrances for out of district tuition still sitting here in the general fund. Now, it was always planned that the entire amount of the circuit breaker for FY12 would be used, which is, I think I just did the journal entry, 1.46. And then the, the other part of that amount would be coming out of the tuition DIN account from SPED. And that was all part of the FY13 budget. But I have elected not to have those expenses sitting in three different funding sources. Okay. I, I'm just moving them now. I, I guess, um, why are we not on that first column putting in the budgeted amount of money? Because this is the appropriation. This is just the appropriation. This, isn't, this is, does not include circuit breaker. It does not include tuition DIN. <clears throat> tuition in appears in, as part of the revolving expenditures. So I'm going to I'm going to have to be reminded almost monthly as this comes through every single time. Is this unique just to this type of an account? Well, I mean, whenever you're funding <coughs> one type of expense out of multiple funding sources, Do you have this inconsistency. Correct. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thielman. The uh, the revolving revenue tracking. This is on a cash basis, mm -hmm. correct? This correct. Is, okay. The, <clears throat> the one so thing that's that, as of that date. As of that date, right. So I, I noticed we had a total budget of 350 on the building rental, and we've collected 208. Have you adjusted the budget for next year? Yes, I have. Okay. I, I had lowered it. You lowered it, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, how do we track where we are in terms of out of district? Payments. We have a very extensive spreadsheet that is maintained on a student by student basis. And so I know very minutely um, what our expectations are for out of district tuition. We also, whenever, whenever a student is placed, we encumber the entire amount of that tuition through mm -hmm. the close of the fiscal year. And as student changes, student placements are changed, say they leave one school and go to another, then the balance of the purchase order the, that's encumbered but not yet expended gets released and a new encumbrance is made. Now, I've made it a priority with the, um, the SPED financial manager to always get the encumbrance in for the new expense and then clean up 
you know, the POs that need to be canceled as we go along. So sometimes it appears overstated, but I would always rather have it be slightly overstated than understated. So that's, those are the two methodologies by which I keep track of out-of-district tuition. And, and I commend you. I think that you're doing a great job on this, but this is something that we need to be conversant on. So that if somebody asks, this, this is the kind of thing that people ask us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how are we doing in terms of out of district sped placements mm -hmm. and the expenses of that? And certainly if I en end up running into a FinCom member at the, at the uh, Stop and Shop, you know, that, 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 that's certainly... <laughs> They're always welcome to call me. Well, they, they might ask me, and uh, they'd right. sort of expect me to know the answer well, as well. Well, and the reason, the reason I leave them in the revol... Uh, the, re the reason I leave tuition in the appropriation in the main budget is because the sum of the expended for out of district tuition and encumbered for out of district tuition is as of that moment as tight as we can our expectation for total tuition for the year. So our, but our, expe our budgeted expectation going into this year, where does that <laughs> lie compared to where we're at right now? I think we're right on in out of district tuition. We were hoping to have some savings but as we've had placements creep up through the spring, we are right on. And, and we'll probably be over next year based on what we can anticipate, but you know we do have reserves to guard that, against that. That's sort of a tracking number that probably, that if we can look to include that in a monthly report, would be a good thing for us to know. So how about another line on the summary page that just that, says that out could of work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a, a lot of these are just check, 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 things look pretty normal, but that's the one that always gives Right, and, and that's exactly why, even though it's confusing, why I leave, why I leave all the expenses in the appropriation until the end of the year, mm -hmm. so I can see it all the time. Because well, I understand that this is really great management, but uh, just so that we yeah. can understand. No, I'm breaking that out as a separate line mm -hmm. on the revolving, just plunking a line down below, yeah. saying this is yeah. our total yeah. tuition, out of district special mm -hmm. ed tuition budget, mm -hmm. and this is where we stand right now. That's that's not a big deal. I'm happy to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Um, I appreciate your explaining where the money for the computer hardware comes from. I would hope that given the recent incident, the Audison, that part of the money will be spent on any necessary security devices, you know, the, the walking carts or, or anything that will keep things from developing little legs and, and walking away. Um, and also, just if there was any additional money which wouldn't be able to be applied to manpower but is just extra, if it's not possible to do a, like a deep, thorough cleaning of the high school, like a deep, I'm thinking of like when you get your car detailed. Mm. I wish we could have someone come in here and just detail. Oh. Oh. I have good news on that front. Oh. We, have, we have successfully hired a day custodial supervisor and we are on the brink of hiring a night custodial supervisor. And I am very excited about what that's going to mean in terms of the overall cleanliness of the building. Plus, um, we will be, as I said, we're out to bid for a new subcontract. Um, but the real problem with the subcontract in addition to the recent events is that we did not have a management position who was tasked to keeping them on task. And so with the addition of these two custodial positions, I'm very hopeful that we're gonna see a real quick increase in the cleanliness of all, of particularly the high school and the middle school. And, and I appreciate that, but I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could start from a baseline of clean and then it's maintained at clean instead of trying to dig all well, summers are usually the time when we're able to get in and really scrub. That's when we strip the floors and, and do the really heavy duty cleaning. And we hire additional staff in the summer to help with that effort. So we should be starting September with a clean building. But it should be maintained at a higher level of cleanliness thanks to these two, these new staffers. I'm very excited about the day custodial supervisor. He's terrific and I think he's gonna bring a lot of energy that we really need to move things forward. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Moving on to subcommittee and liaison reports, policies and procedures. Okay, thank you, Judd. Before I start on this, <clears throat> we talked about a summer meeting. We, my own opinion from my experience is we shouldn't go eight weeks without a meeting. Mm -hmm. so, uh, just, yeah. just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. We try to meet at some point in the summer. Okay, so we have, <clears throat> for first reading tonight, three policies. Uh, BDFA-E-2, 
district-wide goal setting and performance objective process. Basically, we just simplify the process to so it's consistent with what we're now doing under the state uh, regulations. And uh, we require by May 15th of each year, the superintendent shall submit district goals for the insur ensuing, that should be, ensuing fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> So it's a simplification of the policy so it's consistent with state law. The next one is policy CBI, superintendent evaluation. And we've put in um, dates by which um, goals need to be submitted to the, to, the, to the school committee for the superintendent and for the district. Um, and then the uh, policy <laughs> CBI, Dash E, the superintendent evaluation tool goes away because we're now following the new mm -hmm. uh, state regulations. And uh, that's first reading. And we'll read it the second time whenever we meet again. Now or in the summer in September. <laughs> okay, questions for policies for me. Um, I know that in our policy manual, we say by June 1st, we'll have some sort of idea of what policy and procedures we'll do for the coming year. Um, maybe we could get that report. Um, at the summer meeting. Mm -hmm. How about a meeting next week? And, and I'll go over that in the chair report. But would, would that be too soon? Uh, no, I can't yes. meet next week. I'm, I'm out of time. Can't be next week? Yeah, no. So, we, I mean, you want to you wanna report <coughs> on what, what, what policies we're going to do? Yeah, what, what, what section of the book you're going to review? To be reported out of what meeting? <laughs> next one. <laughs> At the next, next school committee. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a report by the next school committee on what we're going to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, budget. Uh, we have nothing to report. Community relations. Nothing to report. Curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability. Nothing to report. Facilities. Nothing at this time, but look forward to going through the NESDAQ report and starting the work. Yes. Uh, legal services. Um, there's a motion, it's in purple on your desk, and I ask that uh, we continue the Legal Services Review Subcommittee because I understood that this was our last, last meeting for the fiscal year, um, and we need a little bit more time to do our report. It'll be, at this point, delivered by the first meeting in October, or I hope earlier. I'm just giving room so that it's done. Um, and... Uh, I'll read the report. I mean, I'll read the, read the motion. Move that the school committee continue the temporary legal services review subcommittee as allowed by policy BDE for the purposes of examining expenditures on legal services, documenting <coughs> legal needs around special education disputes, and performing other work as appropriate. Scope of examination is to include the current fiscal year and as far back in time as the legal service review subcommittee feels it needs to analyze for useful comparison. Subcommittee is to look for a report by the first meeting of October 20. 13 or earlier and we also okay first Second. I'd like to, okay um, would you like to I discuss the I motion? Okay, discussed in advance anyone else all those in favor say aye aye, aye. all those against okay and, great and we did meet um, earlier this week and made some strong work on on what we're going to include great okay. um Chair report, I'd like to um, have a motion on approval of school committee members, uh, myself, Mr. Hayner, and anyone else who desires to attend the MASC, MASS Joint Conference in November 2013. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. On our agenda, I'd like to uh, point out that we have a reappointment of uh, longtime human, re human Rights Commission member A. Nick Menton. A, uh, Nick's uh, CV is on uh, our tables. I've known Nick for uh, a variety of years, and I'd, I'd appreciate a motion on his reappointment to the Human Rights Commission. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those against? Okay. On um, one other matter, it would appear that it would be beneficial, I think, to have one last meeting in June. Um, formally, it's our last Thursday in June, but with the superintendent's anticipated absence on good news for her uh, family and her personal situation, I would like to um, uh, see if we can all get together for a meeting next Thursday. Now, I understand that we were going to do a barbecue as sort of a celebratory sort of customary thing at my home um, on Thursday evening. 
Jeff, you're I'm away. Yeah, you're away. I, I, yeah, I, you weren't away. I thought you were RSVP to the barbecue. You didn't? You know, I, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I actually think I, I think I said it, but I'm away. I, I, oh, can't, okay. be, I can't be there next Thursday. I could be there. The, yeah. yeah. I could do this, something the last week of June, if you want to look at the last week of June. Well, um, yeah, maybe we could do a doodle about another meeting because what I would like for us to discuss in that meeting particularly is what we just received, this thick uh, report from NEASC and, um, and have any questions ready for the superintendent and Dr. Chesson there, thereof. Mr. Schlickman? I, I don't know that I'd want to do that in a formal meeting. I sort of, in, in that we've got a new principal coming in mm -hmm. uh, who's going to be playing a major role in terms of looking at part of this mm -hmm. so that uh, assuming that he takes uh, his position July 1, is that the intent? Yes. That maybe if we were to have a subcommittee meeting to, to start the process where we can, uh, where we can informally start to look at it uh, into August so he's got time to look at it and confer with the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, just sort of get up to speed. Because there's two classes of things in here. Mm -hmm. One is the teaching and learning stuff within the building that he'll be charged with working on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as I read through the report, it looks like we're doing very, very well and that the high school staff already has a handle on what the next steps are. So I'm not really concerned about that. The other side is all the facility stuff. And I, I don't know that having a conversation about the NIASC report it, the, right away is, is going to be the, the, the most productive use of our time. Hmm. So it, this is something we need to talk about, but I, I think that it would be more constructive to have it <coughs> a little ways out where we can start to think about some of the answers on the facilities, short term and long term, and also include the new principal in so we could talk about the rest of it. Well, part of my concerns is in trying to establish a June meeting is obviously to accommodate Ms. Starks. You're away for a couple of months, right? And I'm away starting June 21st through August 27th. So. Correct. So, <laughs> and, and Mr. Thielman made a great point just a little while ago that we shouldn't wait eight weeks or more for another meeting. Yeah. We're probably going to miss at least one of us. Well, yeah. definitely one of us yeah. uh, for any summer uh, meeting. So um, let's try to minimize the, the absence as best we can, I guess, and, and not make it two or three people. Uh, Doctor. Just to comment to what Mr. Schlickman said, um, I'd say the one reason why it would be good to talk about this sometime is that this is going to be being released to the public and there, it would be nice to at least have our first level of questions answered so that when people come to us we're not just going, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, because it gets frustrating mm -hmm. and, and it's not helpful for the schools and it's not helpful for our parents. Mm -hmm. yes, I. Um, I actually wonder if talking about this might be best accomplished at a retreat rather than a regular meeting mm -hmm. because um, this is a lot of information to parse through. We did actually sit down with the NIAS team and heard some of this firsthand from them um, and I believe all the members were present mm -hmm. at that evening mm -hmm. but you know so, some people might want to um, mm -hmm. you know reference their notes and I'm, I'm not sure I could adequately read through this within a week's time and feel that a useful discussion could come out of it without the new principle in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so my recommendation would be that we look towards a retreat at some point this summer where this is an a mm -hmm. item for discussion and that any members mm -hmm. that have specific questions for the report um, address them directly to the superintendent as they go through the report and get it answers from her in terms of the standing. Because without the new principal in place and without um, Ms. Johnson putting together recommendations to the capital planning, mm -hmm. there are certain pieces that it doesn't matter how much we discuss, we're just missing key components. All right. So why don't we, um, we'll, talk we'll talk about it and, and we'll try to Maybe go doodle together and try to maximize our time mm -hmm. together uh, effectively. If if not for one meeting between now and September, then, then perhaps two, a and, retreat and a meeting or something And like in that. the interim, Dr. Bodie, mm -hmm. if, um, if any member was reading through the report and had questions, I'm assuming either you or um, Ms. Chesson would be more than willing to sit mm -hmm. down or have a phone conference to address those questions in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Right, Mr. Schlicker. The one point that, uh, that I think Mr. Thielman was making is that it's a long time to go from now till the beginning of September mm -hmm. to have a meeting because there's business that's likely to come up in the interim, mm -hmm. and having a meeting next week is still going to leave us with that gap minus one week. Mm -hmm. So that so, no, I know. So, I, I, yeah. I, I just want to clarify mm -hmm. my position. I really wanted two regular meetings in June with the mm -hmm. retreat mm -hmm. as opposed to one meeting, which is tonight, and the retreat we had last Thursday. Mm -hmm. I just thought that um, this would be a good opportunity as part of our next regular meeting to, to, to talk about it. That, that's all. And, and, and still have a summer meeting. I didn't want to just say oh, no okay. summer meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're probably going to need one beginning of August just to take care of the business of the district. Something's bound to come up. But do I have a sense from the members as to a meeting before an August meeting? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think Paul's right. You, we, we don't, you, if, you, if we go too long between meetings, then if that first meeting, we're going to have too many things that will pile up. Mm -hmm. So I would say, Judd, that we want to just look at some dates in July and August. We won't get everyone there, it's obvious, right. but we'll do the best we can. Okay. And we can get some business transacted. Mm -hmm. I agree. Great. So. <clears throat> Obviously, the things that are controversial or require a lot of deliberation, we wouldn't want to do. But there are a lot of bit, you know, housekeeping items and things we need to do that uh, a member or two being absent wouldn't really jeopardize. Sign the warrant at the very least. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Moving on to our consent agenda. <coughs> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 13168, dated May 23, 2013. Total warrant amount $615,146.49. Minutes of her approval, May 9, 2013 and May 23, 2013. And the Audison uh, Middle School and the Arlington High School trip to Nagaokyo, Japan, July 6 through the 16th, 2013. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? passes. Secretary's report. Uh, we have received the following correspondence since our last meeting. A letter from Richard Greco regarding the passing of a retiree from the Arlington Public Schools and requesting a copy of the death certificate. A letter to Ms. D. Figlia from Chairman Pierce congratulating her on her appointment to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Email from Principal Villano on the hiring of a new athletic director for the Arlington Public Schools as well as a copy of the press release announcing the hiring of a new athletic director for the Arlington Public Schools. Um, letter to DESE in Massachusetts from Superintendent Bodie about our vote at our last meeting not to participate in school choice for the 2013-14 school year. A letter from MASC telling us about the end of your conference savings to attend the MASC MASS conference in Hyannis in November. Copies of the AHS Senior Awards Night and Commencement Exercise Program from last week and this past weekend. June 2013 copy of the Ponder Report pointed to the superintendent's May newsletter. Email from Mary Cummings requesting the school committee to attend or submit written testimony to the hearings on June 27th regarding regulatory relief in the schools. A copy of the regulatory relief bills before the 188th General Court on June 27th. A copy of the resume of a resume of Nick Minton, whose appointment to the Arlington Human Rights Commission expires in June of 2013, copy of the NEASC report of AHS, and minutes of the EDCO Board of Directors meeting from May 9th, 2013. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other business? <coughs> I'd like to move on to, uh, I'd like to have a motion to enter executive session. Uh, to discuss the deployment of uh, security personnel and devices for strategies with respect thereto, uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel, or contract negotiations with union and or non-union, if which in held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect, renewal of contract with Stoneman, Chandler, and Miller, to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect, collective bargaining may also be conducted. Uh, coming out only for the purposes of adjournment. I have a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Aye. 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 We're in executive session.
Good evening and welcome uh, to the meeting of the Arlington School Committee tonight, Wednesday, July 31st, 6.30. We are in the lovely Selectman's uh, quarters. Uh, this is a wonderful place to be and we are delighted to be here. Thank you, Selectman. Um, we have most of the school committee. Uh, others will be arriving, I think, shortly. Um, to go over the agenda briefly with all of you here tonight and all of you on television, we're going to start out with 20 minutes of public participation. Uh, go on into a discussion of the Arlington Public Schools 2013-2014 school year, led by Dr. Bodie and Dr. Chesson. Uh, we will then enter executive session to discuss um, uh, strategy with respect to bargaining or litigation um, if an opening meeting may have a detrimental effect. Um, so before I get off uh, to start off with uh, public participation, I would like to inform those here in the room tonight and those uh, in the public uh, that we will be having some recommendations after public participation uh, by our superintendent. And those recommendations, to give you a heads up, will have to do with the hiring of three uh, elementary school teachers in the district um, at Stratton, at Brackett, and at the Dallin School. Um, with that said, I don't know if that changes uh, any par public participants or wishes to uh, speak on the matters, but uh, we will lead off with uh, Kristen Chalmers. What? Okay. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to quickly talk, because I know I have three minutes, that about two weeks ago I received my son's class uh, roster and it was 29 and I understand from the other class that it's 29 but I continuously keep getting um, very inaccurate reports that those are not the numbers so I would like to know where these numbers are where, why is why am I I think my counting is pretty accurate it says 29 so I did find out that there is one SLC child in one of the classes and I would like to know why that child is not counted for as a member of the class if the child has is on the roster which this child is and that they are um, they have a desk and they have a place in that community they should be counted as part of that 29 so that number doesn't change so I feel like the answers we get are incredibly inconsistent on are we going to get a third classroom 29 and 29 for third grade it's a really important year it's an MCATS year I think that really needs to be something that we consider and I would also like to address the fact that there has been a mold issue in the basement of Stratton that classroom number 25 the teacher has had to move out of that classroom after being there for a while because um, of the mold situation and there have been children who have been getting sick and there's also I know for a fact that Concrete does not hold mold, but asbestos does, and under that wall-to-wall -wall carpet is asbestos tile. So I would like to figure out, I would like to ask the school committee to try and figure out a way to solve that issue, because if we happen to get a third class, which would be lovely, where are we going to put that class if there is a mold issue? And who knows how many other classrooms in the basement of Stratton or throughout Stratton have a mold dilemma and asbestos dilemma. And that's really it. I mean, I didn't want to, I'm not going to go on and on, so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Megan Card Caradona? Caradona. Close. Thanks, man. Close. Um, I'm also from Stratton. Um, so I'm going to kind of expand upon this kind of a group effort from the third grade parents um, statement from them. And first, just want to express how proud we are to be a part of the Arlington School System and how, much, how grateful we are to all of you for the hard work that you do, because it's not a job, personally, that I would want to have, I don't think. Um, as Kristen said, one week ago, the third graders received their class list. They each had 29 students on it, which we feel those class sizes are unacceptable. Um, with those sizes, it's not possible to differentiate instruction, meet regularly with book groups, guided reading groups or math groups, pull students in a strategy group for extra support, confer with students about their work, differentiate instruction in any content area or keep up with 29 reading 29 writing journals even and writing thoughtful comments back to those students um, this is also the first time the students will be exposed to state assessments as we transition from MCAS to park we need to prepare these students and that will be very difficult in the classroom 29 uh, behavior management management is also challenging think of lost instructional time 
just transitioning such a large group from one place to another or if children start to act out on a daily basis and this could easily happen in a class so, so, so large. Uh, truly one teacher no matter how good cannot meet the needs of 29 students which include general ed students with IEPs and some ELLs as well. Um, we were aware in the spring of the likelihood of these large class sizes and we made numerous attempts beginning in May to contact Dr. Rudy to express our concerns and schedule a meeting with her. Most of these contacts were not responded to directly. Um, it was not until June 28th that Dr. Bodie um, sent a letter to the parents stating that there would be two classes of 27 and 28 and offering to meet at the end of the July. That meeting did take place last night. Um, some of our additional concerns include um, that you know Stratton has hosted other schools and really feels that we've received not much back in return. Um, and said we've repeatedly had some of the largest class sizes in town. Um, you know, Dr. Bodie has stated to us last night that she wouldn't let kindergarten sizes go above 25, but this particular class that we're speaking about had 28 and 29 in kindergarten. Um, they also had 27 in first grade at in at least one classroom that I'm aware of, and they all, in addition, they had no devoted principal their, their first grade year, as well as being mixed with Thompson students the following year. Um, in addition, the Sims project um, it brings some concerns because these homes are in the buffer zone between Stratton and Bishop. Um, although nobody can predict the number or ages of these students, um, Dr. Bode won't assure us that any incoming third graders would be sent automatically to Bishop. Because if there's a family with other children as well, she would have to look at each grade and figure out what was best overall. Um, this may make it more likely that she would send them to Stratton as most of the other grades have space. Um, so being proactive and assigning another third grade teacher would make it easier to filter the Sims families towards Stratton without overtaxing the classrooms, teachers, and students. So we're asking um, you to reconsider the decision to have only two grade three teachers at the Stratton School for the next school year. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Lauren Boyle. Jeff. Sure, Jeff. Um, I just want to first start out um, by thanking Dr. Bodie. Um, it's terrific news to hear that there is going to be a recommendation in the school committee um, for these three positions. Um, as happy as I am to hear this, and it's terrific news, I do think it's kind of a Band-Aid um, and something that we need to look at, I would ask the school committee maybe to look into some kind of long-term feasibility study or something like that about what we're going to do about this overcrowding problem. It is, it is a, an issue. And um, as we've seen with redistricting, um, it, that unfortunately has not solved a lot of this. And for those of us who live in the Heights, especially um, in the Dallin area and the Brackett area, I mean, we're just busting at the seams. And so um, this is something that is not going to go away. I, I'm here today to talk about my son, Jack, who's going into the second grade, who I've been very worried about, about these large class sizes. We've had a lot of turnover with our special ed department at Dallin. Uh, Jack is on an IEP, and it's, it was just very concerning to us to have these kind of large class sizes and all of these new teachers coming in on the specialists and things like that without um, hearing that there would be any kind of aid or assistant in the class. So I'm thrilled to hear that there is going to be a new hire, but I do, I am thinking about my youngest next year who will be coming into kindergarten. I just am looking at these class sizes. We've yet to be in a class at Dallin with under 25 kids for my oldest and um, my middle. Um, so we, we have large class sizes and I don't see it getting any better. Um, and as we all know, each class is different. I, I, my daughter's class, she's going to have, there's 25 and 26 in her class next year. But I'm not here to discuss, I'm here to discuss about my son because that particular class has so many more needs. So I, I would ask that the superintendent and the school committee, when you're looking at these things, that you look beyond the number um, because sometimes there are special needs within the classroom um, that we do need more teacher's aides or we do need more classroom teachers, and it's not just so much a number issue. So I applaud you all. I thank you very much for this, but I do look for the long term, and I, I would love to be part of that help any way I could, um, but I think that we should look into this um, because it's not getting better. So, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Marie Walsh Condon. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, school committee and Dr. Bodie. Thanks for uh, all that you do for our children. It's greatly appreciated. 
Uh, I'm a physician. Family medicine is my specialty. I've been a member of the Board of Health here in Arlington for the past five years, representing our community on various public health issues. I just wanted to take a brief, brief moment to just highlight some key aspects of the development of the seven-year-old child. I'm the uh, mother of a rising second grade student at the Dallin, which is why I've, I'm very happy to hear that there's going to be a recommendation for another um, classroom. Uh, socially, at this age, um, children are now starting to make comparisons to other children in the same age group. You know, why does Joey read chapter books and I can only read this type of book? Uh, they often crave independence and responsibility, but don't quite yet have the maturity to execute certain tasks without guidance. Uh, they are starting to begin to really have an in-depth understanding of social concepts like justice and fairness, deeper understanding of rules and consequences. Uh, they're starting to sympathize with peers. This is when they can really recognize bullying on the playground and uh, bring that to the attention of somebody who needs to intervene. Physically, however, they still continue to have a high energy level that needs to be calmed at times. They are really starting to hone their motor skills if guided, which is why we all learned how to write cursive when we were in the second grade. Um, emotionally, they can often view criticism um, or, or even observation as a personal attack and take things personally uh, without reassurance. They can victimize themselves um, and it can lead to feelings of inadequacy. Uh, you know, a, a, a saying might be, you know, I'm not going to bother to study for that because I, I can't spell those words anyway or nobody likes me anyway. I'm not going to try to be their friend. Um, intellectually, however, they are exhibiting logic in their thinking at this point. Um, they're developing an intellectual curiosity. Where do babies come from is a com common second grade question. We all need to, you know, be able to answer that. Um, they're able to do more complex problem solving if challenged, um, which is why board games were developed um, with uh, seven-year-olds in mind. Um, all of this, though, does take... Uh, some guidance and, and some attention so I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that there is a recommendation to make this classroom size a little bit smaller um, just as a real brief aside I'm a lifelong Arlington resident born at Sims so now you know how old I am and have seen these schools grow and change through the years and I hope that we can continue to work to provide the high quality education we're known for thank you very much thank you Lynn Carden thank you uh, thanks for uh, Thank Dr. Dr. Bodhi for adding the positions. Um, I did want to address the budget issues around this because that's what I do. I do the I look at the budget. Um, it's relevant not just to these positions, but possibly to any other um, unmet needs that have arisen. Um, you know, I, I urged you in the spring when I spoke to you to take a fresh look at the budget either at your end of June meeting or over the summer. Um, and you're not you haven't done that yet, but I hope you will do that that soon. Um, there have been changes. There always are changes. Uh, the changes this year have, have been mostly on the good side. The special education circuit breaker, which was in the budget for $1.4 million, that was because the, the governor had cut some funds during the year, but he was able to put those funds back. So we actually received $1.5 million instead, $90,000 more. Uh, we received homeless transportation funding reimbursement for the first time. Uh, that was $68,000, which we received on July 3rd. Um, there have been some teacher retirements. I'm aware of three. I mean, I'm sorry, five teacher retirements. Typically, the teachers leave at a high salary level and are replaced by entering teachers at the lower, lower salary level. So if you do a, a, a conservative assumption of $15,000 savings for position, that's $75,000 just for the teachers. There are other uh, retirements as well. And then the grant picture. Overall, the grant picture is, is uh, very stable. Um, the allotments, the final allotments may not have been made yet, but all of the state grant programs, the METCO program, the kindergarten program, have been funded at the same levels or higher than last year. And the federal pass-through programs, uh, those allocations, most of them have been made, and, and those are also stable, whereas the budget expected them all to decline. Um, it appears to me to be about $100,000 of additional revenue from, from that. So that's $300,000. Um, now, things move around in the budget. I'm sure some of those dollars have already been accounted for. Maybe they were spent last year and just, just are being carried over. I don't know. Um, but I do hope that the administration, and, and, and it will come to you at a future meeting, with a fresh look at the budget um, so that you can see if there are any other, other, other unmet needs uh, that you might need to allocate some funds to. Um, I do think that since running the deficit a few years back, we have been very conservative. In, in our operating budget. Typically, that's a good thing. Um, but I think perhaps we've, we've gone too far over. 
and there are some un unmet needs like these three teachers um, that we really do need to fund and I'm glad that we are able to find the funds for that and we're not being too cautious. We do have um, lots of reserves now. We've got the special education circuit breaker money coming in this year that we're not going to spend till next year that we can always rely on. We have a special $500,000 special education reserve fund and we've got um, close to a million dollars last time I checked in various revolving funds um, which again can be used in the event of other overruns. So I, I'm glad that you, we, we do seem to be able to find the funds for this posi these positions um, and I do hope that we will be a little bit more assertive and aggressive um, in meeting unmet needs as they come up um, given, given the relatively favorable picture that we're finally in. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Simcoe. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I didn't really come prepared to uh, give remarks, but uh, after speaking with some of the fellow parents, uh, I had a couple things to say. As somebody who uh, works in the field of science, technology, engineering, and math education, uh, I work on this at the collegiate level. Uh, my wife is a researcher on STEM education at the K through 12 level, and uh, much of what I want to say reflects her thoughts on this. Um, I first want to say that uh, when we moved to uh, Arlington, it must have been about seven years ago, uh, it was because we had this sense that this is a place uh, that actually had excellent schools uh, without really having the pressure cooker environment that some places that have excellent schools have. Uh, and that was really important to us. And I think that uh, the, the, all of you here are to be commended uh, for creating this kind of wonderful atmosphere. Uh, and as a result of this, I think actually there's, we've been sort of a victim of our own success. Uh, in the sense that we start to see uh, some of these issues of overcrowding, uh, like several parents have been discussing here. Uh, I've seen it uh, at the Dolan School because my son is uh, in the second grade as well. Uh, and I would just echo the comments that Lauren Boyle had made just a little bit earlier, uh, that because uh, people are starting to realize that there's this, uh, this confluence of excellent educational opportunity uh, with a nice community, uh, this is leading to demographic changes that I think are going to be long-standing, uh, and it's something that we're going to have to think about uh, moving forward. Uh, so uh, for better or for worse, that's uh, what we may be heading towards. Uh, now, coming back to the issue that uh, I was discussing having to do with my wife's uh, research in education, uh, one of the things that I get to see is that there's different trends that come and go in the fields of education research. Uh, you know, but something that she and I talk about fairly often is sort of the new math. Uh, which we thought was taught quite well uh, in uh, my son's first grade classroom. Uh, but people have different ideas about these and sometimes it comes and goes. Uh, there's one thing that everybody agrees on. And the one thing that everybody agrees on in educational research is that small class sizes benefit students. So to the extent that the budget allows it, this is always the right thing to do. Uh, and in fact, uh, something that I found interesting is that 23 states actually have laws on the books that require uh, maximum size, or they, they require uh, more teachers to be hired if the classroom sizes exceed a certain amount. Uh, and what was surprising to me is that Massachusetts, uh, given its reputation as probably the best state in the union, uh, or at least in the top few for educational opportunities, is not one of these states. Um, so uh, we're not required by law to do this. Um, however, uh, there's been interest in uh, passing laws like this in Massachusetts. And in, in fact, one of the champions of uh, this legislation uh, is our own representative, uh, Representative Garbali, who I, I understand anecdotally may have served on one of the committees here in the past, although I, I don't know that firsthand. Um, and he's been advancing legislation that was brought up in 2012 but didn't pass but may uh, come up again that would limit class sizes. Uh, something that's been interesting is that um, this uh, legislation is targeted more specifically towards, uh, not necessarily towards towns like Arlington, in fact, sir? We're, we're just limited into three minutes, and we have one speaker after you, so I'm just being, asking you to be mindful of the time. Okay, Thanks, let Robert. me wrap it up. Um, so the thing that was interesting was uh, that uh, this was targeted towards schools that had a large fraction of their students on the uh, school lunch assistance program. Uh, and I don't know that Arlington would qualify for that. Uh, my sense is that this was because these communities were deemed most uh, at risk for having very large class sizes. Uh, Arlington is very lucky not to be uh, necessarily in that uh, in a position where uh, where there are, is a strong need for a large fraction of the students to be on assistance. But I'm glad that uh, in fact it doesn't look like we're necessarily as at risk as we had thought for these large class sizes as well. Uh, if these recommendation will go forward, um, 
which is something that we very much appreciate. But I, I see this as something that uh, will be a continuing issue going forward. So thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everyone uh, who hasn't spoken here tonight who would like to speak to us to email us, to write us letters. Uh, we've received some emails over the summer on this issue and other issues. Please continue to do that. Um, 20 minutes of public participation isn't enough for the entire community. So I invite, um, at least for me, I'm sure my colleagues will, will agree, uh, please contact us. Our emails, our phone numbers are on the district website. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bodie, Dr. Chesson, I'd like to introduce uh, you to those here. Uh, most of you know. Uh, most of you know each other. Um, would you like to, who would like to go first on this, the start of the discussion? I, of the, I will. Okay, thanks. What I wanted to do tonight, I want to address the issue of enrollment and where the, the budget, how we we're able to do this. Um, but in terms of like an overview of what we want to do this evening, is just give you some updates. Um, there's a number of reports at your desk. Some of them we can address in more depth later on, but just some snapshots around enrollment, um, where we are with, with hiring, this is still an ongoing process, and then uh, uh, Laura Chesson is going to give us a quick report on where we are with technology. So going to the enrollment, uh, the enrollment issues, we are, in, we are seeing this year a dramatic increase in our elementary enrollment. And so tonight I'm just really going to limit my comments to what's going on with um, elementary. Compared to October 1 numbers last year, we're up about 140 students. Now, there, th I don't want you to take that as a final number. There's going to be some decreases, there's going to be some increases. In fact, um, one of our speakers tonight spoke to the 29. The, so the 29 included two students that were in a transfer situation. So they were on one list and, and potentially on another list as well. So that, that was part of it. And there is still some of that that's going on in schools. We're in the process of reconciling withdrawals in the schools. Sometimes the schools know um, more about who is withdrawing, moving out of state, moving districts, and so forth. But let me come back to that in a minute, because I, I want everyone to understand where we're able and why we're able to make this recommendation this evening. Um, as you recall, when we, we set the budget for the year, we made, a, we made an initial estimate of a reduction of 10%, and we changed that to 8% for our, for our um, grants, which represents sometimes as much as 17 or 8 to 19% of our budget. Um, the, we then changed that to 8% and with, with the hope that it would only be reduced 6%. And the reason for that was sequestration at the federal level and also the uncertainty what was going to happen at the state level. Fortunately, that did not come to pass. We have learned over the last, and some of them coming in as early as in July in terms of the homeless number, but special ed grants, Title I, we're seeing that the grants are very close to what they were last year. So. For whatever reason, at the federal level, they're funding K-12 grants at, the, at last year's previous number. So what that does is allow us to um, have money available for, as, as Mr. Cardin talked about, and other people, the unmet needs. We've had some unmet needs that we've had to address in special education. So some of the money we had to sit down and really reconcile um, where we were at the budget to where we were with hiring and uh, some, uh, some issues there. And we have done that. There have been some retirements, there's been turnover savings, but then there's other positions that have been expensive positions to fill uh, just because of what the market is. So we have been, some, we're, we're at an equilibrium at the moment on this. So what we have available is some additional money through, through the grants. Had this not happened, I will have to say we would be in a very difficult position to address um, some of these needs. And, uh, and until we actually, again, looked at where we were with the budget, and we did quite a bit of that uh, discussion today, um, I couldn't go forward making this recommendation because we're not going to be in, we don't want to be, before we start the school year, looking at uh, some difficult budget situation. So there, th these are not the only class sizes in the district which are something that we have to have on a watch. 
What is happening for this year, and it's actually quite a surprise, is the increase in the number of elementary students. We have, as I said before, increased about 140 students since, last, since the October numbers came out. Now, to give you a perspective, when we looked at the last two years, and we had a report on this this last year, we actually started to see the last two years, 10 and 11, and I actually had those numbers, as a total elementary population, in 10, there were 25, 2,520, then it went to 2,583, and then it dropped again this last year to 2,569. Well, now up to 2,700, a little over 2,700. And we have more, more people making appointments to register. Um, and anecdotally, I've learned even today of some people who haven't even, they're not even made appointments yet, but we know that they're going to make appointments. So this, is, this situation is not over yet, and we're going to be having to see what happens over August. Right now, our kindergartens are, is up to 466. I think that one of the things that's very concerning, and it's to the point that um, Ms. Boyle and Mr. Cardin alluded to, and that is the the issue of the size of our schools. We, we, we did a lot last year in terms of looking at buffer zones that could help us modify class sizes. And without this big influx, I think that it would have had, uh, it was looking actually fairly good in early June that we were being able to manage it a little bit better than we have in past years. But if you look at, um, you know, Bracket and Dallin right now in, ter in terms of total school is up to 480 students. And that's, that's a lot. And what's going, what this is going to mean um, at Dallin in order to have this extra kindergarten is that it's a choice between the computer room and the music room. And that, kind of, that discussion uh, Dr. Woods and I had today, and as, as did uh, Dr. Chesson, we've been looking at that. We don't know quite which way it's going to go, but that's the level of, uh, that's there. At Bracket, we have a, a similar situation. We're going to have to find another place for our learning specialist because we're going to have to take that room. The computer room went last year. So we're in a very tight spot. Um, there's, uh, fortunately for Stratton, with um, Thompson moving back to their own school, there's a little bit more breathing space there um, for some extra extra classrooms, particularly for breakout rooms. So this is an issue, and you know, the, the last couple years did not indicate that we were going to have this, all of a sudden, this spike. But, and it may be an aberration. It may be this year, and then we'll level off again. It's just, it's just very hard to know. But it is something that we need to address, and as we look to the budget next year, when you have class, schools that are much larger than other schools, I think we may need to start thinking about um, extra support for those schools in terms of administration. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about this this year, but as, as, as many of you know, we're moving in, in fact, you all know, we're moving into a new evaluation um, system that's going to require our principals and our department chairs and all, in, in all of our system principals to be in classrooms more doing observations. But when your, your school is almost twice as large, and in one case it is twice as large as another elementary school, this is an issue in terms that we have to look at. So an issue of space. Um, we, when we were looking, looking at redistricting last year, we had the, the, the three schools, Pierce, down and bracket and bishop and and it's very hard to move within that and really make any substantial um, changes when we have this kind of influx. So this is something that I totally agree that we need to take a look at. It's um, it, it it is it is a problem long term and I don't know I don't have a crystal ball. The only thing we we are the we are the recipient of all the good work that we've been doing because people want to move. Here to town, and we're seeing a lot. I've seen a lot of that, particularly this summer. This is really a summer phenomenon, because in May we did not see this kind of shift, let alone at the budget time. So that's that's where we are with respect to um, the enrollment. And when we meet again at the next, we'll have a much clearer idea 
of exactly what happens over, over, over the next month. So what we will be looking at is um, to look at the space issues and what makes the most sense in these schools, uh, particularly down in Brackett, and of course we'll be, we're going to begin very soon the, um, the hiring process. Right. I don't know if you want to, to ask any questions about this or... Does anyone have any questions on enrollment? Mr. Hanna? I Is a question about the grant money appropriate at this time? To, to supporting the enrollment? Uh, yeah, I guess that would fall under the discussion. In our, in our budget and everything, and I'm, I'm, I want to make it clear, I'm very supportive of having the smaller class sizes and having the teachers with this question. By taking this money, are there any, were, with the anticipated cut in grants, were we, see, were we anticipating reducing programs or whatever the grants were for? We'd already done that. So we will continue with that by using this grant money, some of this grant money to support the lower class sizes. We will we will continue it at the program that we were planning on going through. With yes, the we've been or, able or to changes. Yes, but we also have been able to enhance one program um, a little bit by offsetting uh, through some additional Title One. Title One is actually the grant that we got a little bit more. The others are pretty much level. Okay. But, I, I, you know, Laura, I don't know if you want to mention a little bit how we're using some of that money. We had an extra, uh, about 15000 there. I yeah, think. Title I um, will we'll be using for some additional math support at Thompson and Pierce. So uh, we'll definitely have the programs that we planned on, and we'll have an a little bit additional support in math at Thompson and Pierce. In so there's not in that area of math, yes. But the, but the other grant money that, in anticipation of cuts in it, the programs that were planned for will not be put back. There were, there were no programs. I, I understand what you're saying. I think what you're saying is because we had cuts in grants, we cut programs, or that we anticipated, anticipated we were going to have. anticipated the cuts. We just, we, there were no cuts in programs in order because of the, the, the cuts in grants. There were cuts in other areas. There was no programmatic. Then, then, then let me re add to it. The cuts that were <coughs> anticipated, the support, the potential cuts. Yes. They will be continued. Those cuts will stay there. The answer is yes, but no. But for example, we we anticipated being able to provide less professional development because our Title II grant was expected to be eight percent less than it was, and it's pretty much level funded now. So we're, professional we're talking development. Approximately one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars for three teachers. We use the fifty-five thousand dollar figure for a teacher, don't we? Yeah, we use fifty-five. Yeah. So that's one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. My, I just want to be upfront. I'm supporting and I will vote for the three teachers. There's no question in that. And not because you folks are here. I mean, <laughs> I'm a former educator and I appreciate everything with a smaller class size. I just want to be upfront with the public to understand that what we had planned on doing, there has to be some give and take here, unless we've found a magic $165,000. Well, the money for this, th this is mainly out of the special education grant that we have it, it, and then it becomes a well what we did have to increase our special education personnel um, that was very clear and so we had to make sure that we were able to cover that but one of the things was um, a particular gift uh, that was alluded to is that we received actually it was 80,000 about $80,000 more uh, for circuit breaker from last year and it's not next year so we were able to cover a, a, a big chunk of that with that 80,000 and a little and some of the um, the okay. transportation. My concern is that this money is not basically put on the base. And this is, I don't want to say a one-time thing, but it's going to be hard to continue to support the staffing that we have unless we get more money mm -hmm. in the long run. I'm saying this to the parents, I'm saying this to the folks at home, that, that the budget is going, we're now adding three teachers, and we may have to add other staff in, during the year and stuff like this. If this is done by extra grant money and things of that nature, it can't be sustained in the future unless the budget itself is increased. And I'm asking you all out there to support that. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. I, I think what uh, the superintendent is trying to say is that there are things that we normally do which are grant funded eligible that in anticipation of reduction of federal funds, 
that we budgeted for out of local money and as the federal money came in we were able to move our local money to uh, higher uh, elementary teachers which ha has to come out of local money it can't exactly. come out of grant money exactly because I, I and I think that w the way we budgeted this was was proper because I know that in Lowell uh, that we were expecting a hit on our federal title money and and it was twice as bad as we expected so we weren't level funded we, we were taking a hit up in Lowell uh, so it was very prudent to uh, move some of the uh, expenditures that we need to do uh, into, into local money uh, in anticipation of a reduction of federal funds. That's exactly what happened. So yeah. they were moved into operating, and we can now move them back into the proper grant funding, and therefore that opens operating money up for this. So we're not paying for these teachers mm -hmm. directly from Grants. the grant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really shifting, mm -hmm. the shifting money that we had put into operating, mm -hmm. moving that back into the grant. So we're, they, they scrutinize what we do very mm -hmm. carefully mm -hmm. and we have to submit very detailed reports. So we are squeaky clean about all of that. Yeah, I just want to make it very clear that we're not supplanting no. uh, with uh, grant funding something that we should be paying out of local revenue in, in that what we were doing was looking to cover an anticipated loss of grants uh, with local revenue and with the mm -hmm. additional grant money coming in, we're now free to go and do this. I agree that, the, that it, it is a concern. I mean, the, the one thing I want to say is the school committee has been very much aware of the enrollment issue. Uh, it, you're saying we have 2,700 kids in our elementary. Uh, 20 years ago, we had about 3,700, maybe even less, 3,400 total in the district. So as Arlington became a more desirable community, the number of uh, children who are being educated in the public schools has increased dramatically and we're obviously still seeing the, mm -hmm. the gains of our success. And we have spent a lot of time in school committee meetings trying to be strategic about what to do because this group of kids will eventually end up at the Odyssey. And we not only have to worry about class size, but we also have to worry about facility. Is this a one-time deal or is this going to be a permanent increase in our uh, six through eight population. We have to weigh facilities considerations of what to do about middle school, how to handle our elementary enrollment, along with the needs of a high school that is in risk, in, in warning on accreditation because of the condition of the facility. And uh, we need the state to be a partner with us in terms of meeting the facilities needs. So the facilities issue is a very difficult one that's certainly on our radar. And you know, uh, when, when you start budgeting process, this started in Jan you know, January, we had to have a final budget prepared for uh, town meeting by April. Uh, we're doing this with the best guess as things change and they do. Uh, you have to have some ability to uh, uh, go and make changes, and I'm glad that uh, with, with the federal money coming back a little stronger than we budgeted, that we're, we're able to go and do this. This is a, a concern of ours that we do have an increasing enrollment, and we do have funding rel uh, capped under the fis fiscal management plan uh, based on, uh, on the last override. So these are continuing challenges, and be aware of that and make sure that your town leaders, the people who normally sit in these seats, uh, are also aware of our needs. Ms. Um, I just wanted to point out though, first of all, this type of situation where we have increased enrol enrollment that exceeds what we expected, mm -hmm. we've been in the situation before. Mm -hmm. Thanks to grant money coming in higher, doing what Mr. Schlickman said, we can put it where it was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. We had the money available to expand our classrooms. Mm -hmm. These students are gonna count for our October ones mm -hmm. though. So we're not going to see money at, at the, from the state this year for these children, but we will see money for the state next year for these children. So the, while the town does contribute a significant amount to the education of all our students, we will get some reimbursement or relievement from the state. These three positions are not completely on our budgets back rolling forward, and that's something that the budget subcommittee has looked at the the piece though I wanted to add to this is it's fortuitous that this additional money got realized 
at a time we had this need. Mm -hmm. The Budget Subcommittee did, though, forward a list of um, recommendations on projects to accelerate that we saw as crucial to um, raising the level of education of our students that are being phased in, such as um, math program purchases, such as the technology piece. And I would just say that from this day forward, I would expect that list to also be referred to where we are if there is some any additional surplus that comes in that reduces mm -hmm. what comes out of the town's coffers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my bit about the budget piece. Um, in terms of the kindergarten enrollment, um, this is the first year that we actually have had the buffers really in place for this. Um, and I'm noticing that with the exception of the bracket, which has just been solved, these are the most level sized classes I've ever seen um, in terms of coming in. And I'm wondering whether you feel that having that access um, to the buffering helped do that or um, whether you're collecting information so that if the plan does need revision at some point we have some concrete data to look at well I think we need to I'd like to reserve and comment on that till later so I can sort of look at the whole piece of it um, it has helped but it also you have to understand we had two reserve positions in the budget They've already been expended on kindergartens, one to Dallin and one to Stratton. Totally unpredicted. Now, I tried through the buffer zones to keep the Dallin moving so that we could stay with three, but it became impossible. And in fact, I had to move some other students around after consulting with the, the families. So. We, I still have to go back next week and look at the people now that we have these other kindergarten, this other kindergarten, what do I need to do with respect to wait lists to make sure that we can maybe even them off a little bit more. So there's still more work to be done on this. Uh, we're keeping all the data. You're going to be able to see all of it. We'll get a complete report to you um, on this. We ha I don't even know the no number right now, but I think at the end of June, I had evaluated about 80 applications for buffer zones. So it's a significant number. It, it fell a little bit less than 25% because the buffer zones take about 25% of the town. The total number, as you can see, if it was 80 at the end of June, it may have changed now because last week, for example, we had 20 registrations and we're looking at 11. It's just ongoing. It's been an, an absolutely uh, it's a bit unprecedented in the summer anyway. So let me reserve on that and wait and see. But it, we, it was not 25% of the total number for a kindergarten that was in that, in the buffer zones. Um, in light of what you just said, Dr. Bodhi, I do wonder though, as we're adding classes to accommodate certain um, influxes for grade levels, are what um, safeguards do we have in mind for pretty much the design strand per grade for each building? So if we're adding a fourth um, Dallin kindergarten, excuse me, not a fourth, a fourth bracket kindergarten, um, are we then putting ourselves in a position where next year we can never have more than three or, or we're forced to compress? I know. Those are, those are some of the long range things that we have to look at. I mean, one thing that we couldn't do at Bracket, we can't do it in such short term for this year, is um, take a look at um, special education programs, look at daycare. But the, the thing is, as a, as a community, do we want to have schools that are super large and other schools that are not? And uh, I, I can. I don't know if that percent of the buffer zones can really entirely deal, deal with the kind of growth that we're seeing in the areas that we're seeing it. It's really, it's really just tinkering around the edges to keep them a little bit more even. But even then, you know, the, the numbers are growing. Uh, it, having classes of 25 and 24 and 26 are becoming more of the norm in this town 
than, um, than not. I don't like to see kindergartens go over 25, and particularly didn't this year because of um, the new tools of the mind curriculum that we're putting in. And uh, because larger kindergartens do put in other pressures on teachers, and we're trying to be able to do a full implementation this year. I wish I had a crystal ball to say how this is going to go in the next few years. I don't know. Um, well, but clearly, clearly, our, people love coming to Arlington, moving to Arlington. Which is a very positive thing. Um, yeah. I do hope, though, as we look towards the space issue, that we also think about um, where the age divisions are in terms of which building students attend and whether we need to think about something different for the Audison span mm -hmm. and whether that works well with the um, K to, K to mm -hmm. 5. Thank you. Okay. Um, first, I want to point out that I have a conflict of interest, and so if this comes to a vote, I will be abstaining because of that. But I did want to point out we need to hear if I understand we're mainly talking about elementary school here today, but we need to have some idea of what's happening with the middle and high school. I mean, if they suddenly had 300 students at each school or something in addition, we need to know that now or we're going to look really silly when we find out in a month or two. So I'm just concerned that there's a whole chunk of numbers that we have not heard. You yet. haven't seen that. I, I will have to get you that report sometime in the next week or so. Um, right now, the registration for the high school and the and the middle school are done at the middle school and high school and the the high school um, has been doing it through guidance so I don't have all of the updated numbers there yet nor do I have the middle school I will say that the schedules are almost done at both and so far uh, the people who are doing the schedules have not said we've had a few sections we've had to add but not an alarming an alarming number a few you know a point two here we need that and uh, you know we need a couple other sections here but pretty normal pretty normal um, this is this has not been the norm for the last couple of years having this kind of spike at the elementary mr. film oh yeah, yeah. So I have the same issue as Kirsty. I have a conflict of interest. I can't be voting on the motion. And usually I'm the guy that just puts it on the table. It's with me so long, but I can't do that. So <clears throat> here we are. So I would say a few things. Um, I think we have, uh, as we, we, we have to learn from this experience and we have to do some, uh, we have to be proactive about planning the FY15 budget in light of our experience this summer. And I think we're going to need direction from the team, the leadership team of the district on a few things. First of all, what's the priority in terms of these larger schools? The Brackett and Dallin is, is, a, is a priority, some more uh, administrative assistance, administrative uh, leadership to do the evaluations. Is that a priority, yes or no, and why or why not? We need to start to think about that if we're mm -hmm. going to... If we're going to add those positions and if we're going to advertise for those positions, you start advertising for a position like that mid-year. So we need to think about that. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing is we need to, we need to really think through, is this a, a one-time event, this 5% increase in enrollment, or is this, a, is this the beginning of a trend? And there needs to be some thought, reflection, research on that. Because that impacts the budget going forward. It impacts how many, mm -hmm. reserve, uh, how many reserve positions we put in the FY15 budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then, <clears throat> you know, there's this ongoing conversation that educators always have, we, we always have about... Um, about class sizes and um, teacher effectiveness and what's really important and what really drives uh, student improvement and student performance. And so I think we need to have that conversation in public, perhaps in our subcommittees, so that we can, we can, we can flesh out some of the issues that, that, that surround issues like class sizes and what really drives teacher, what really drives student improvement. Because there's a lot of debate and a lot of research about whether the, the, the degree to which class size has an impact on a child's learning and the degree to which the quality of the instructor has an impact on a child's learning. A lot of research out there on that, a lot of division, and we should explore that, talk about it, think about it. Mm -hmm. So those are some points. But I would say there's a timeline here 
in terms of the direction we want to go for FY15, especially if there's a desire to add some staff to some of these places, and that is that we really need to think, get this straightened out and talk this through in September, October, November, so that we can make some judgments for the next year. This, this, the motion is, is a motion to approve these recommendations. So we're not moving, it's not a budget transfer, we're not transferring money from one bucket to another. It's simply a motion to approve the superintendent's uh, recommendation. Well, I can't move. Mr. Schlicken? I, I think the motion is to amend the budget uh, by adding the positions. So uh, my motion, in, unless I, I would stand corrected, I move to amend the fiscal 2014 budget by adding three positions a teacher for bracket kindergarten, a teacher for Dallin grade two, and a teacher for Stratton grade three. Second. Any further discussion? Um, do we, typically we don't actually state the, mm -hmm. the schools and the positions. We well, usually just, well, 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 I was gonna say, yes. not that I don't want them to be anywhere else, but, but that's not, that's not, well, actually, what we directing do in the original budget is we have the staffing laid out for us within the budget, and we're approving that that staffing. So that if you take a look okay. at your budget book, you're you're approving positions right. relative to schools. Yeah, this isn't okay. reserved actually, teachers that we're approving. No, no, no. But pretty much we we we're approve it. We, have, we approve it both ways. We approve the and we're placing we, them in specific right. places. That that's the. I, you know, I just was raising the question of procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Procedurally, I think it's, nope. I think it sounds. I withdraw the question then. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those against? All those abstain? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. huh? All right. You, Dr. Bodie, thank you folks for coming tonight and speaking to us. Please stay in touch over the summer. Have a good mm -hmm. summer break though. Um, this is very strange watching yourself on the video. <laughs> Just don't fix your hair. Right. I didn't look up. I didn't look up. Dr. Bodie, you had mentioned two other things on this. Yes, I just want to give you an update. We're yeah. going to spend more time on this. This is just a snapshot right now, because um, I thought you'd like to know, since we're meeting anyway, to get a sense of this. And, and I apologize that we don't have all of this to you more timely. We we're sort of scrambling mm -hmm. to, to sort of stay with what, all that we're doing right now um, and getting some report to you, which we normally wouldn't put together until um, much later. But just, th so these are not final reports, these are just moments in time in terms of where we are with hiring. So far we've had 37 hires and we are not finished. Obviously tonight we have more, but we also have a number of other positions um, that we, we need to fill. Um, we have teaching positions, we have um, teaching assistant positions, and what happens in the summer, and those of you in schools know this happens, is just there is changes. There's, I don't think a week or sort of, sometimes even a day doesn't go by where there hasn't been you know, some change. People have to they move out of town or they get a different job or what, various things. So this report here, and, and it's really, I don't need to go through it in any great, in any great detail, but um, Mr. Spiegel put this together for you in terms of um, just so you have an idea of where things are with respect to um, the different positions. And, um, but one of the things that I think that it w is worth mentioning is that it remains true, and I think this isn't just true for Arlington, it is true in other districts as well. One of the sure ways, the surer ways to have a teaching position, which um, are are very difficult to find mm -hmm. at the elementary level in particular. We can get a thousand applications very quickly when we post something, easily. Is that if you've done your student teaching in the district or you've been a teaching assistant and people can see the quality of your work, mm -hmm. um, that, that you have a little bit of an edge. Mm -hmm. So we put a lot of time and attention too into the people we have as teaching assistants and very often, in fact I would say 
majority of our teaching assistants are either on the road to certification or have their certification. And as you can see here that we, we hired um, eight, eight this year so far. Um, and we also did people who had their student teaching here, five that were, did their student teaching in Arlington. And then we had some people that were also returning. So I think that this report will be updated. You can see from the chart here by school um, where the hires were, but it's pretty, it's, there's hiring going on in every, in every, in every school. Um, so that hopefully is helpful to you to see where, where that's going. Any questions from the committee on hiring? We will give you a more complete, I should say, um, I should add, we, we've had some more success this year in, in hiring, um, a minority hiring, and you'll get a complete report on that later. Mr. Hanna. The three positions we just approved, uh, is there anticipation of internal people? The answer is yes in one of them. Because, uh, I mean, August is tomorrow, and, and it's going to be very, very difficult getting these positions filled, I think, this late. Well, we have some other positions, too, elementary positions that are, that are happening at two schools. And so the two principals there are going to, it's actually two grade four positions, and they're going to jointly interview, <coughs> sort of combine forces on that. And um, Thank you. yes, it is. It's, it's a lot. And the principals, they have to pull together a little <coughs> team. It's a lot. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Finn? Do you have a sense of the salary exchange with some of these hires yet? Are you, are you kind of tracking that, or is Diane tracking Oh, yes. <laughs> well, we definitely track it. Yeah. And in fact, that was one of the things um, we had to do was to, to tra tracking all the salaries against the budget to see where we were. And um, we were a week and a half ago uh, just fine. Right now, um, uh, we, we'll have to do that again in a couple more weeks. So there's not a... A surplus in the, I mean, so it's, so it's just staying even, so you're not saving money. We're, we're, we were not, we were not, uh, no, we didn't have a surplus, no. Because oh. I mean, it just seems that when you, it just seems that when you're replacing, although, so it's, it, would you then I have to assume that you're, some of the teachers you're replacing are not higher, necessarily higher paid people, they're people that are leaving the district after four, five, six years, or. That's happened. Yeah. That's happened, and, um, and yes, we haven't had a few retirements. But then if you hire someone that, in some positions, the market is such that you're going to, you might actually end up having an exchange yeah. of equal salaries. Um, because some positions are very hard to fill. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Bode, if you'd like to, uh, do you have another? Um, I was going to ask uh, Laura to give you an update on where we are with technology. Did you have any question on the staffing? Um, I have no further questions on staffing. Um, I, your hand I I'd, I'd like to ask through the chair approximately how long, because how long do you think your, your presentation I can to? do it in five minutes, 10 minutes, 15. You tell me how long you want it to be, and that's how fast I'll um, do it. Well, we just got the materials tonight. If we could just have a brief five-minute overview sure. from you, Dr. Chesson. Absolutely. Chesson, fine, and then we'll Thank digest you. it. Sure. Okay. We'll, we'll have you. a more complete one in the fall. This That'd is be, just to give you a snippet of where we are. And, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've been focusing um, on technology, as um, Ms. Hyman uh, talked about. That was one of the, if we had end-of-the-year money, that we wanted it to go to that. Um, in addition, we all always have an investment um, that we make every year in technology. So we're going to be um, putting an, a large amount of technology at the elementary schools and a little bit at the Audison that's funded by the school budget. Um, those will all be in the neighborhood of iPad carts. We have had um, some pretty hefty professional development for every teacher um, that's going to be in a school that's going to have iPad carts. Uh, we are also making it very equitable uh, by the end of the summer every uh, elementary teacher will have their own iPad and there will be at least three iPad carts in every elementary school and in, and all the way to that runs the gamut till Thompson which is going to be a one-to-one -one. Um, and that's because of the the construction that's allowed we've also had a number of um, partnerships that we've now begin to set up uh, through MassQ and an organization called LaunchLearn. Um, we have uh, four, or five, actually five, um, companies that we're working with that are gonna allow us to pilot or beta test their software for free, and we'll be giving them feedback 
Um, two are in the area of supportive mathematics, one is in computer programming, and um, two will assist us in doing our literacy work with our students. Um, in addition, I have to, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fundraising efforts from the Arlington Educational Foundation. Um, they, as you know from last year, have started a capital campaign for fundraising. We've had a number of events. Um, we currently have um, in the neighborhood of $40,000 per year pledges for three years. Um, this is to fund uh, STEM technology at the high school. Um, we actually expect that money to, uh, that amount to, to increase. Um, and efforts are still continuing. Um, Matt Coleman and I actually went to Google today and had a meeting with um, that company and we have uh, another local um, entrepreneur that we're going to be uh, meeting with either next week or the week after. And these folks have stepped up and are hosting evenings where we bring in people within the district um, that are in the technology field and might be in the position to make um, sizable donations to this program. And so we'll be continuing that over the summer. Um, one of the things that I want to call to your attention is the Scratch Camp, uh, camp which is a one-week uh, camp for programming at the middle school, and that there has been, um, uh, recently in the paper you may have read that there is an a number of organizations in the state that have reached out to the governor's office to try to include um, the requirement for programming courses or the programming standards, computer science standards, to be included in the next generation science standards. Um, it looks like that that's um, very likely going to happen as Massachusetts selects which part of the next generation science standards that it adopts. And so um, I think we'll be poised to be able to meet that need should, should that go through. Um, I just The last thing I want to talk about is uh, professional development for support technology because there was concerns raised about the committee about the level of technology that we're putting into the buildings and would the teachers receive support. Um, we've run a number of, already run a number of iPad 101 sessions um, where folks that received an iPad were required to come for four hours of training and many of them have signed on for additional trainings um, without that requirement of their own volition. Um, for the second half of the year, we'll be uh, second half of the summer, we'll be running Tech University. Um, if you have time and you're available, if you'd like to come to Thompson um, next Thursday and Friday, we have most of the Thompson staff will be in for the beginnings of Tech University Phase One, where we have outside consultants from EdTech Teacher coming in to train our teachers. The next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we have about 65 teachers coming, of which about 20 are from Thompson and the rest are from all the other elementary schools and, and the uh, middle school. Um, we'll have outside staffing as well as our own teacher leaders that will be working with those teachers. Um, but one of the things that we are very excited about is that we will be running a graduate level course, um, blended learning course for um, primarily for Thompson, Pierce, and Stratton teachers because it's going to be funded funded by Title I next year um, to allow them to better utilize technology to meet the needs of all learners within the classroom. So we'll have more for that uh, for you as we come into September. Great. Any questions from the committee? Thank you very much. Um, no other... For a motion? Yeah, I would love a motion. Um, I'd like to motion to enter executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares and exit only for the purposes of adjournment. Second. Don't, don't we need to name the contract? Um, yeah, we probably should. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed that in the middle. And discuss contract with Stoneham Chandler, Miller, potential renewal. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. We are in executive session.
Good evening, the Arlington School Committee uh, tonight is started. My name is Bill Hanna, I am the Vice Chair. The Chair is not able to get here, be here tonight because of family obligations. And uh, Ms. Knox is also not here. Uh, up front, uh, I see no one signed in for public participation. So we will begin right away with the enrollment update from Superintendent Bodie. Good evening, everyone. Um, we have had a very active summer with enrollment. Unusually so, uh, it's, it has spiked um, our number of elementary students since our October 1 numbers, which are our official numbers of the school district, are up, even since the chart that you received, are up to a difference of 119 students, and we've had more people registering today and more appointments tomorrow. Which has, as you know, necessitated this summer adding five classrooms in total, two of which had been part of our reserve positions uh, from last year's uh, budget projections for FY14, but we've had to add three additional classrooms this summer. We were able, to, fortunately able to do that because uh, our grants, federal grants, came in even while we had made the assumption last year due to sequestration concerns of, of anticipating an 8% reduction. In fact, when we began the, just as an aside, as we began the budget discussions last year, the recommendation was as high as 10, and we brought that down to 8, uh, with hoping that would be 6. So when they came in in August, level funded, that was very helpful in, in addressing some of these enrollment concerns. So it has been distributed fairly evenly, but one of the things that is also um, uh, uh, a difference from last year, we are approximately up 40 students in kindergarten. We have an enrolled class right now and increasing of 470 students. Uh, last year's uh, enrollment numbers for kindergarten, October 1, were I believe 434 in that vicinity. So we're seeing a major spike in our elementary uh, enrollments this summer. I will say that it's been very helpful, and we'll hear more. And I can give you a more uh, involved report uh, later this month. But it's been very helpful, given this spike in enrollments, to have the uh, redistricting plan in place, having the buffer zones, because we have been able to, um, even off class sizes, uh, somewhat. On the other hand, class sizes are growing just simply because there's just more students. And of particular note are down and bracket which um, are, are both over 460 students. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of students, and I don't know whether this is an unusual year or whether we're going, this is a trend. Previous years, uh, the last, I should say the last two years, um, we had seen some growth, but sort of an, uh, it had really started to taper off a little bit. And then uh, this was totally unexpected. Most of, the, most of these enrollments have occurred since May. As far as the high school and the middle school, the, the numbers that you see are slightly down from last year, but um, I would not mm -hmm. think that these are the numbers. The, the numbers traditionally in the high school change in the first couple of weeks of school, um, and I expect that to happen again this year. <coughs> The uh, middle school probably be closer to these numbers, so the middle school numbers are staying somewhat even to where they were last year. So even though we've seen this, this big spike at the elementary level, um, our net district at this point is um, under 100 students. It's probably in the mid-80s. But again, these are not our official numbers, and I know that they are going to change over the next couple of weeks. And, and uh, Mr. Schlickman did a very interesting graph earlier uh, about some of the trends that we've seen. But, but the trend overall, the trend line in that was just mm -hmm. a steady upward growth. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Mm -hmm. I'd just like to uh, reiterate to the public that, uh, as I said at our last meeting, uh, we're fortunate that the grant money came in uh, at the level we weren't expecting it and it allowed us to do this. We will not be able to sustain these uh, program these added classrooms on grant money so we're going to need the public support 
with our budget coming up in the following year if these numbers stay the way they are. Thank you. Uh, moving on, hiring, uh, update on hiring. Uh, Dr. Bodie, Mr. Spiegel. Did you, I'm, I'm did you have anything on. else on the room? Oh, you were, okay. I don't, unless there's some other questions. We will give you a more updated sure. report as we go forward. Mm -hmm. But this is just where we are at the moment. And um, it is an ever-changing scene these days. Sorry. Okay. No. Sorry. Right. Mr. Spiegel. All right. So I, I sent, we'd sent out the interim hiring report. And again, this is interim staffing a report as of two days ago, August 27th. It has changed. It changes a little bit every day um, as we um, new teaching assistants are hired. Most. Uh, I think all of the teacher positions are filled now. I don't think we still have any to to hire for in that are AEA unit A positions. Um, that you know what you have from two days ago is uh, 53 new people. That is equal to 47.1 FTEs. Um, you know, as I, I sort of gave you some. Facts about some of them. There's a most of the, the majority are replacing teachers who retired, resigned, or taking a leave of absence, or moved to a different position. Um, about 19 are filling new positions. Some of the positions that Dr. Bodie referred to earlier, that because of the added classes, some that we when we when you approve the budget in the spring, we added another learning specialist at each school. We added Mandarin. We added some other classrooms. Um, and um, you know some are just partial part-time uh, positions that are giving a little more um, coverage in some subject areas. Um, you know we have one teacher voluntarily went from full-time to half-time, and we hired a half-time person to fill in, and that worked out well. That's at the Audison. Um, that that was we were able to do that um, in that particular position. Um, one thing that one trend that we continue to see is that many of our teaching assistants who work um, in the elementary school, middle school, high school, um, get positions as teachers. Um, the, they, a lot of our teaching assistants, as I've said before, are, are um, licensed teachers. Many have master's degrees. And because of, especially at the elementary level, there are so many, the, the pool of qualified candidates for all school districts is so large right now in Massachusetts. There's many um, teachers looking for jobs we are and many other districts are able to hire teaching assistants who have licenses and master's degrees and they do a great job in, in Arlington and the principals get to know them, the teachers get to know them and they end up getting jobs in Arlington. Um, we've had six uh, who did student teaching in Arlington. Again, we get great student teachers from all the local ed schools and um, they, if they do a good job and the teachers and the principals get to know them, they, that's a great way to, um, to get hired in Arlington when there are positions that open up. Another trend that uh, we see um, is that we have returning teachers. Seven of our hot new hires this year are people who previously taught in Arlington and left for various reasons um, to, um, you know, to stepped away from the profession for a while to raise a family and are coming back um, or went to another district and are coming back. And I think that speaks well to Arlington, that people who have previously taught here and left on good terms and liked their experience here, want to return when the time is right for them. Um, as the report says, I've met with all the new teachers one-to-one -one over the summer in our um, shared office space over the summer. We were trying to find places to meet um, where uh, Dr. Chesson and uh, Ms. Johnson we were sort of sharing an office for a couple months in the summer as there were some renovations up here. Um, but we were able to have the meetings with everyone. I. Obviously, I reviewed the salary schedule with them, placed everyone on the salary schedule, reviewed essential information, including ethics, law, uh, compliance, went over health insurance options, the orientation schedule, and uh, et cetera. And the orientation um, for all the new teachers um, just completed this past Monday. Obviously, the first two days for teachers in the district, for all teachers in the district, were today and yesterday. There was a new teacher orientation on Monday at uh, the Audison Middle School that um, Mr. Hainer spoke uh, to the, all the new teachers and Dr. Bodie spoke to all the new teachers. And there was some curriculum training last week for a, a lot of the different curriculum areas. Um, and the teachers have, or get a lot of training here and we'll have 
um, a very solid mentoring program run by uh, Marie Janiak. Um, so I, the li we list the hires by school, by subject and grade. Um, that's pretty set right now in, um, for, for teachers. Um, and I want to thank, um, again, as always, this is a team effort. The staff up here on the sixth floor uh, do a lot of work to get the paperwork generated um, for all the new hires. Kelly Piggott in my office, who uh, manages benefits and many other things, uh, helps all the new hires with health insurance and other benefits. Judy Chabader, also in our office, does a lot of work uh, getting people set up. Um, Maria Lalicata, who is a new, uh, who, who moved from the payroll office to the superintendent's office this summer, um, took on the role that Pat Plaguey vacated when she retired, and that involves generating many, a lot of paperwork, a lot of letters for all the new hires, and she's done a great job keeping up with it. There's been a lot of letters to go out, and people in the payroll office, all the, uh, there's so much to enter in to make sure that we hire these people, they get paid, and uh, there's a lot of work, the whole team, and all the people who do the hiring, the principals and the curriculum directors, have a, a, a huge job. Um, some of the other notable hires, as you know, we hired a new high school principal, the Hardy School principal. We um, made official appointments in the budget to add a full-time uh, high school assistant principal. That was a, an increase from a half-time position in the previous budget and added a full-time middle school assistant principal. We added a school district accountant. We made um, we, as the revisions for special education department. We have coordinators at each level that we officially appointed. We have a new nursing supervisor who, um, after Lucille Nicholson uh, retired, um, that's Sue Frankie, who had been a nurse in the district for several years. We have a new attendance officer, diversion coordinator, following um, Ms. Digby's uh, retirement, and um, that's uh, Cindy Sheridan Curran. And again, and we've continued to hire teaching assistants. The final thing I'll talk about, teaching assistants, we've really been in the last couple of weeks hiring a lot of new teaching assistants. Most of these are replacing teaching assistants who left um, and filling some of the, the new configurations at the schools, as you might remember in the new budget for this year. The basic configuration for teaching assistants at the elementary schools is two um, special ed inclusion teaching assistants who will work with the new learning specialists and one building sub TA who will sort of float through all the building wherever needed. There are other teaching assistants in the special programs as well. Um, so because the, the hiring comes pretty late and it's actually maybe a little too late, the, later than we'd like, but what tends to happen since I mentioned most of our teaching assistants have licenses and are looking for, they don't want to be teaching assistants for their career, they're looking for teaching positions and there's a ripple effect throughout the districts surrounding us that there are openings come up, these teaching assistants get jobs as teachers or guidance counselors or whatever and leave, and, which is understandable, and so we have to fill in with new teaching assistants. So there's a lot of uh, hiring going on right now um, with, with that. And then um, we just hired a new data assistant that was part of, uh, that, was a, that was a position that was approved um, to work with Leilani D'Agostino in our as director of data to help with the student registration and enrollment in, in our um, district data and um, that will be a big help and I can take questions if people have any and oh the next just I'll mention in one of the next meetings in September I'm not sure if it'll be the first meeting or the second meeting in September we'll have the ethnic diversity report that we always have but we don't have all the information yet to give you are there any vacancies or any positions you're still trying to fill? There are some teaching assistant positions that we're trying to fill. So all the other... I think everything else is um, pretty set with all the other t the teacher TAs. positions. Yeah. Um, I know we're trying to increase the diversity of our staff, and I wonder if, if there's a path from TA to teacher in the district, if there's any way we can get any more... Diver TAs of diverse backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, and then, and we do have some TAs of diverse backgrounds, and we, um, and I, you know, I don't have the the diversity report tonight, mm -hmm. but I can tell you just anecdotally, we have done better this year than we have in past years. We have some teachers of color that we've hired, mm -hmm. and um, I think they will be positive. Um, it's positive for the district. They're mm -hmm. great people. I think uh, the people who hired them, um, you know found that they were the best candidates for the job. So 
we'll have the numbers um, in September sometime, but um, we are doing, I think, a little bit better this year than we have in the past. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you personally, and I think the rest of the committee does too, for the awesome work that you've done. Uh, I think very few school systems are on the first day have all their teaching staff in place. I think you'd, thank you. you. I mean, of you the, the, so that. I will say the only thing, yeah, there are, as always, and every year we're going to have some leaves, maternity leaves. We have some subs to the long term sub positions that we still will need to hire, uh, but they aren't starting right now. We have the long term subs in place who are, who are for the teachers who are out right now. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thompson School ribbon cutting ceremony. Dr. Bodie? This is, we are so pleased where we are with Thompson Elementary School. It is going to be opening next week. In fact, um, this last, last Thursday, there was a Thompson parent student picnic and students and parents were able to tour the school. We've had some committees and we're opening it up to trying to get more employees down there, town employees as well, to, to be able to see the school. Last week though was a, which would have been a prime time was a it was a very busy week as still furniture trucks were coming in furniture being assembled paper on the floor but that is all very much settled down right now and teachers have been in this week uh, setting up their classrooms so we i know that there's tremendous interest in the the community seeing the new thompson school and I, and our, our new reporter at the advocate spencer buell is here tonight and he did a, a, a terrific article um, on the new schools with a few pictures but we need to have more 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 pictures for the community um, and i think we're ready at this point to do that it'd be nice to have more of the classroom set up i think by early next week that will be uh, well certainly by early next week will the school will be in tip-top shape waiting for the students to uh, to come in um, but because of the a tremendous interest in seeing the school we were we've set the ribbon cutting ceremony i think a little earlier than we have in past for past schools that have come online and it's going to be September 15th at 2 o'clock. Um, we have been working on the program for that day and uh, speakers. And, and uh, the chair of the committee, Judge Pierce, has agreed to, to say a few words. So we have, we have a program. We had a committee from, that was a subset of the Thompson Building Committee meeting to work on what the program will be that day. We are going to keep it short as possible uh, because I think that the real issue is uh, being able to, to come and celebrate the opening I would I think this can be about a half hour program we're gonna have some music we may even have a, a, a student speaker we're, we're looking into that possibility and uh, mr. McCarthy who is the executive director of MSBA will be the representative from MSBA at the at the, uh, the ribbon cutting following that two weeks later on September 29th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, on it's a Sunday as well, we're going to have the dedication of the Thompson Library in honor of Mr. Bill Chase. And Mr. Chase was a member of the Thompson Building Committee and the permanent Tom Building Committee, among all the other activities he's participated in over his, his very dedicated life to, to this community as well as Salvation Army and other endeavors. But specifically with regard to the Arlington Public Schools, um, he, with several other people on the Permanent Town Building Committee, oversaw the rebuild or renovation of the middle school and the other the five elementary schools. And his commitment was to, to finish it, to finish Thompson and certainly to, um, to see the upgrade of Stratton as well. So the new Thompson was a dream of his and he was uh, a very special person and that the library will be dedicated and they're working on a program for that day as well to which you are certainly all welcome in fact we would hope you would be able to come so we're, we could not be more pleased about uh, this, this the status of the school um, I, I I do want to take this opportunity right now since we're talking about the Thompson School and I will say this again because I think it's worth saying 
these these last two years could have been really they were challenging. They were challenging year to take a very large school relatively and move them into different schools. And uh, the, the, the Thompson teachers were amazingly flexible, um, but equally so were the, the host schools, um, Stratton, Bishop, and Hardy. They opened up their arms um, and they made this work. We did something that we've never done before when we've had schools re relocate is that when they were in the host school, classes were blended. So Bishop students and Thompson students were in class together and the same thing was true in all the other schools. Teachers formed new friendships, new, um, new strong collegial relationships and uh, I think it was a bittersweet moment when they all had to part ways in June but it still was a very enriching experience for, for everyone involved. And so I, I thank them for their flexibility and their graciousness. Uh, and same thing for the parents. The parents, PTOs, could not have been better in the process. But we were ready to move on. And thank goodness we were able to move on because these numbers this summer would have just been really difficult to accommodate. When you think about it, when you, you're talking about 120 new students in the elementary. That's a third of a school in one summer. It's huge. So anyway, it's, it came in on time and under budget and we're thrilled. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, I don't know if it was the acoustics, but um, the library was being dedicated to Mr. Bill, Bill Shea. Bill Shea. Oh, yes. oh, what did I say? I was okay. Bill, I, Bill Shea, yes, I'm very sorry, yes. Okay. I have a friend. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, if you ha if this just gets to the public, because I think all the members of the school committee have been in the building, but you try to make the ceremony and try to stop by the building. It is a, it is a spectacular building. It's uh, it's a great design, and it was uh, budgeted appropriately. We, we I think we're spending less than a lot of other communities on uh, for our school in Arlington, and that's a tribute to a lot of things that happened in the course of the of the. Uh, all the public deliberations to get to the the uh, agreement we reached, but <clears throat> um, it's 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 an example I think for the rest of the state because it's a well-designed school and it's smartly designed and it's cost-effective. Mm -hmm. It's a cost-effective school, mm -hmm. and I think we've set an example for other communities. So it's a great school to go see, and if you haven't seen it yet, take a take a walk around. There's some spectacular views too. I mean, just when you get in the building, the views are just unbelievable of the playground and the area around it. And I think it's going to transform that whole mm -hmm. neighborhood over time. Yes, it will. And a lot of thought was put into the the placement of the school so that when you didn't any any part of the neighborhood would not see a wall. Yeah. It would be seen something that would have um, an, an angular diagonal view of this of the building. Um, actually, the way it's been placed on the site, there's more land there than, than you had the sense of when the old Thompson was there. The landscaping um, is very nice, mm -hmm. the playgrounds as well. Um, one of the things that is part of the green school is you'll see that there are raised beds for, um, the, for every class to have a garden that they will as part of their curriculum. In addition to that, there outside of each one of the kindergarten classrooms, there's an open outdoor classroom where they can they can go out and there's a bench um, to sort of define the area a little bit better. But we were able to get pretty much, I would say, close to the maximum uh, chips points, which are, have to do with issues of uh, environmental greenness and and, and uh, efficiency. Uh, that, that really added to the state's contribution to the school. So it is. It's a very efficient school. Um, even little details about having the windows that face the sun in the afternoon, having outside shades to, pr to protect more light coming in, but at the same time forcing the light along the ceiling so it's reflected into the classroom. It was very well, well, very well thought out. <laughs> So it's a beautiful building, very whimsical in some respects. I think um, 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Buell talked about that, that used that word too. It did, have, it has that quality, which I think a lot of children are going to, mm -hmm. to really love. In fact, the principal, uh, Sherry Donovan, and I, and I should give her a lot of credit. I, I, she has been there from the very beginning of this project, and I think that she des deserves a lot of credit and recognition for the work she's done this summer just to keep the project on point, you know, and making sure the furniture was there, it, the technology was ready to go. And in fact, uh, Laura will talk a little bit about some of the technology initiative around Thompson this summer that involved actually the whole district as well. So it, all in all, it's, um, it's turning out very well, and I think that uh, Bill Shea would be thrilled to see this. And in, in, the, and in the, one of the pictures that was here, in fact, it's on the, well, it's actually up in the library area where you'll see this mosaic, I think I can, I think I can. That was one of his favorite books, and of course, anybody who knows knew Bill, knew what an energizer mm -hmm. person, ener energy person he was. So it's, um, a, it'll be a great tribute to him. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, carrying on with Mr. Thielman said, I would invite the people to come and see the shades. I won't say any more. The shades are a unique part of that building. Uh, I didn't know what they were when I first saw them, and you had to explain it. On the outside? On the outside, yeah, the sun the, shades. The shades are on the outside of the building, and they do the job. I couldn't believe it. Uh, they're so simple. And go and see them. Was it? Any other comments? I, 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 a couple of weeks ago, I went and peeked into one of the windows. I was driving by about 5.30 on, on a Friday afternoon, and little did I know that uh, Principal Donovan was in her office working and, and, and getting this whole thing ready. So I know, scared her. <laughs> well, I don't think I scared her, but it, you know, it was, I wasn't expecting to find her there at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, but there she was. And uh, uh, she, she's so proud of the building and, uh, and I think that there's a lot of love that's gone into it and the kids are just gonna be thrilled. Mm -hmm. Even just going there, there in April and seeing the way it lays out, uh, kids on the third floor, are, are going to have such great, beautiful, inspiring views out those windows because right. because of the way it's set on the property and mm -hmm. the, this diagonal and it's it's just I don't think even by looking at the outside, which is kind of cool, uh, you're going to get a sense of just how spectacular it is on the inside and what a warm, uh, mm -hmm. positive place it is. Mm. Moving on, superintendent's report. Mm -hmm few things. So, um, the first is, well, the status of the schools. You asked that question, <coughs> Mr. Hainer. We are, um, we've had a, a much shorter summer than in past years, ending on June 28th and starting on August 28th. It feels very sh much shorter. And it has been a difficult summer with all the projects going on around the district um, to stay on, on on top of all of the cleaning that goes on every summer. And, uh, but despite that, and despite some very hot weeks, um, our custodial staff, um, along with a lot of the college students we hired, did a, did a terrific job. Uh, other than the high school, which is, will be finished by this Friday, the other schools were ready for teachers to be in them a, a week or so ago. So and, in fact, if you were in any of the elementary schools at the end of last week, and certainly this week, you'll see a lot of teachers um, back preparing their rooms. So they're, they're, they're in great shape. Um, and uh, as you can see up here, we completed this project, which was initially inspired by being able to put these new HVAC systems in, which will save us an annual cost of about $50,000 in electricity. Um, and we were able to fund this through a grant but in doing so, we we're also able to, to, to upgrade this room, which is used all the time during, even though you use it, this district uses it as well for a lot of professional development. So this looks, I think, a lot better. I know a lot better, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, when um, Diane Johnson is here at the next meeting, uh, when she gives you a financial report, she's also going to give you a more detailed summary of the capital projects that were done this summer, just so that you're aware. All right. 
At the last meeting on July 31st, we had a number of parents um, from Stratton attending, concerned about grade size, the, the, the number of students in grade three, but they were all, the one parent and had expressed uh, concern about mold in the lower level of Stratton. And in fact, this had come up the, the night before when I had met with them up at Stratton. And, you know, we don't take these types of things, uh, concerns very lightly. So what we did is we hired a firm um, out of Woburn called um, ProScience and had them do an analysis of the rooms that, were, that are down in the lower level. And, and, and we, in your report that you received, you have these specific room numbers. And to take a look at what mold structures may be in the um, atmosphere of those rooms. Since there are no state and federal guidelines around what is the proper number to be in, a, in an interior space, the way that it's done, this is the industry standard, is to compare the outside mold structures to what the concentration is in the interior spaces. And that was what was done. And what, what they found is that the outside structures per cubic meter was 916 structures per cubic meter. And the indoor concentrations ran, ranged between 32 and 194. So if you were to average that over the classrooms that were tested, it's about 85 structures per cubic meter, which means that on average, there were 10 times more mold structures outside the building than there were inside the building. Um, but one of the things that you always want to do too over the summer when you have a lower level such as we do at Stratton is to make sure that you're keeping the moisture level as low as possible. And um, all summer long, 24 hours a day, we ran humidifiers in all those rooms. The carpets were cleaned, uh, in fact, dry cleaned. And the, the, so I, I feel very confident to say that those rooms are very safe rooms mm -hmm. for our students and staff to be there. And in fact, the company, when they wrote the report, <coughs> um, said that there's no abatement is recommended at this time, given their... Mm -hmm. uh, given what they found. So I just wanted you to know that because you were made aware of this as well at the last mm -hmm. meeting. Good. Just to mm -hmm. clear, the current emphasis on new schools and new classrooms and stuff is not to have any rugs at all. Uh, That's correct. Uh, is there any thought to removing these rugs in the future? Absolutely. Um, we've had that on our capital list. It's actually fairly expensive. I understand that. Uh, to do it because <coughs> we're actually going to have to replace uh, the flooring underneath, which, by the way, our custodians did go in, our maintenance people as well, and, and do visual checks. And there, there was no visible mold on, under the rugs or on any of the structures in the room. But when some of those, there's a couple of rooms um, that we know that when the carpets come up just because of the uh, that they're going to be bringing up tiles. And so we really have to retile everything as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and probably we would need to do, right now it's uh, contained, but we might have to do, if we test it and see what we'd have to do okay. more abatements. So we don't, we know that it's going to cost about 15,000 in rooms, something like that to do. And how many rooms still have carpets? Just five, five rooms that do. Thank you. But you get the idea of where it is. Right. So there's a lot that still needs. We're, yeah. We have money for the windows and the library. We want to get those in this year, and there's a the number of things. But it's on our it's on our radar screen of trying to move forward with Stratton as, as we can. All right. Um, I was going to ask um, Rob if he would talk a little bit about the report I sent you from the. Uh, Traffic Advisory Committee, and let me yeah. just preface it a little bit. Um, well, I'll let Rob talk to it. But basically, anytime we have decisions we want to make around where they advise traffic <coughs> supervisors to be stationed, we go to the Traffic Advisory Committee to get their analysis. And and Rob, you can talk a little bit more about that because you've attended some of the meetings this summer. Yes. Um, 
so as you probably you, you know or recall that when Thompson has been closed the last two years, we have redeployed several traffic supervisors to the Hardy area. Um, we actually had a, a two on Mass Ave this past year, two years, um, and one more right around Hardy for the additional uh, students coming in, walking from Thompson to Hardy. Uh, now that, um, and we also deployed an additional traffic supervisor to the Stratton School because of the Thompson bus. And we needed um, some help there because of the students coming on the bus. So there are actually four positions that are um, going to be redeployed from the um, three from that were added to the Hardy area, one that was added to Stratton are being moved. We also, we had one um, supervisor we've had at the um, Dunkin' Donuts um, that has been a Thompson position um, on, on, I think, the North Union and Broadway Dunkin' Donuts um, that Dunkin' Donuts pays for. And we've had that and we're going to continue, continue to have that. So what's going to happen is most of the traffic supervisors are on the list are going to stay where, or where they were last year at the other schools. Um, the changes are Thompson were, um, there were a couple concerns of with the, the safest uh, places and the best places to put the traffic supervisors um, now that we're back at Thompson. One is um, going to be at Broadway and Everett Street. Um, the other, the other one is, as I said, staying at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, then there's going to be one um, on the North Union Fremont Street Purcell intersection. Uh, there's a lot of walking to the Thompson from that area. Um, so there'll be one there. And then um, there'll be one at River Street, University Street, uh, Univer River Street, University Road, Cornell Street, um, which is a block away from the main... Um, entrance to the Thompson on Everett Street. There will be staff at the Everett Street, um, River Street crossing um, that will help the students um, across the street and, uh, d during um, the busy traffic times. Um, the other place, um, so what happened is we had 15 traffic supervisors total in the budget from last year that were carried forward in the budget to this year. There was, an, the Transportation Committee looked at options for the 15th traffic supervisor location. Um, and they, they listed them in order from their perspective on safety priority based on traffic. And, um, and they listed them at the Chestnut Medford Street, Ridge Street, Crosby Street, and Ryancliffe and Dow. And we can only put one, we only have the funding in the budget for one position at one of those locations. Um, so we are going to add the position actually at the Ridge and Crosby Street location near the Bishop School. Um, we have had one, one at the Bishop School, and we would add one more at that location. Um, the recommendation is, um, they did recommend one at Chestnut and Medford Street. Um, I know the superintendent has been in touch with the administration at St. Agnes to see if they would fund a traffic supervisor there, but because it is not an Arlington public school, it's a, a parochial school, a private school, um, we, we do have um, a position at the international school that is funded by the international school. Um, so we would, um, we would do that if the St. Agnes would fund it. I don't know if the superintendent has any other comments about that. We would. We just, they were, the principal is going to take it to the board, but I haven't heard anything further. Any comment? Um, yeah, I actually uh, emailed MASC about that position because I was wondering about the legality of it and they said that we would definitely need to talk to our legal counsel because um, that the town or school district is barred pr from providing services only to a nonprofit using public funds by the anti aid amendment of the state constitution and I'm not saying they don't need a traffic supervisor near St. Mm -hmm. Agnes just that I'm not it's not clear that we could do it legally mm -hmm. and, and fund that position. Yeah, I actually have not talked to town council specifically right. about this, and um, I, I, I will if this if there is funding for it um, from I, St. Agnes. I would. Oh, I've, if they're paying for it, I don't think there's any question. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I can forward you the rest okay. of the email. It, 
Yeah, I mean, that was, that's obviously a, one of our concerns as well. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a public safety issue. And I think in some ways, I mean, it's, it's a difficult position for, I'm not a public safety expert. I mean, I think the people at the police department are public safety experts, and that's not my role. But it's, it's sort of, I'm sort of learning more about it as I, in this job. So it's difficult for, um, in some ways, this is a town function that we have assumed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Any other comments? I'd like to just, number one, these are Arlington residents. This is an, I'm talking about Chestnut Street. Arlington residents who paid taxes to the, to the town, and these are public streets. These are not part of the school proper. If we were asked to, to consider putting something on that, and I don't feel it's a, a, a equal comparison with the international school because the majority of the students at the international school are not Arlington residents. Um, the, as far as the providing a service to the school, I would disagree. This is providing safety to the Arlington children. That's my comment on that. I would ask um, if there was no, I would ask you this, if there was no funding uh, coming, if they weren't willing to fund it or capable of funding it, would you, and there was not a conflict, would a uh, legal conflict of doing this, would you reconsider Chestnut Street? And that's a hypothetical, I mean. It's a hypothetical. Um, and you may not want to, I, I appreciate your position, but. It's, it's a, I don't think that there is an issue that it's prep, it's needed, but I'm not saying that, well, uh, TAC did order these, there's, also a sense that all of these places they recommend are equally necessary. I would say, I want to put this in perspective. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago, we had, I think one time we may have as many as 40 mm -hmm. um, places in town where we had traffic supervisors. Mm -hmm. That's why we, we work closely with the, um, the traffic advisory committee because there are, there's a lot of need to do this, but if you recall, when we had the budget, um, we had to do four million dollars worth of budget reductions a number of years ago. Th that was one of the things that we made a decision about. So we have added more in. In fact, was when Thompson was being relocated that we did added a couple more positions. But our budget is where our budget is at I, the moment. I appreciate that, but my concern is that this is one of the most busy traffic areas in the town. They're all, and the priority there you have too many, it's a cut through. Mm -hmm. It's a traffic cut through in the morning and in the afternoon. It starts at about two o'clock in the afternoon. I am concerned about it. Uh, well, as our, with, the, with the committee's uh, acceptance, I would ask, uh, Rob, to just check with town council if, about the conflict, potential conflict. I can shed some light. There was a time when we paid for a position. One of the 40 slots was at the St. Agnes, and the, and the district paid for it. So then we cut uh, the trap. So I'm not sure. If, I think legally we were fine, and it was because it was a public safety issue. I think it was it was cut. I don't. When we made the cut years ago, it was it was due to the budget. <clears throat> it was just due to the budget. That's all. <clears throat> When we had the budget super, uh, the budget supervisor, uh, when we had the traffic supervisor over there, they were stationed at uh, right at the traffic signal. All they were doing was pushing the, the button to change the traffic lights, which certainly was non-productive. This goes back to uh, about 2004, 2005, when we had the 40 traffic supervisors, and we went around looking to see where there was actually kids crossing, and our pedestrian flow and our kids were not aligned to where our traffic supervisors were. So we had traffic supervisors sitting in their cars at a location with no kids and some really dicey locations like on Mass Ave uh, that had no traffic supervisor and a lot of kids crossing. Uh, so we, I, I'm really happy to see the, the uh, uh, TAC getting involved in, in being strategic in terms of the placement. Uh, MASC, I, I, I saw the email back, and it does raise an interesting legal question, that if the police department, out of their public safety uh, budget, 
decided they wanted to put a traffic supervisor in, in a location for pure safety reasons. That would certainly be within their purview, but for us to go and do it was sort of their legal question. And they didn't come out with a firm statement, but they said, tread carefully and check with your uh, legal counsel. But if, if they are willing to pay for it, I think that's probably the best option because, I mean, if, if the more we go and open more buildings and, and change our traffic patterns and have more kids going in more different places, we're spreading out the resources we need for, for traffic supervisors. And, and it's, it's, I don't think it's inappropriate for us to uh, uh, ask for a partnership uh, when, uh, uh, when a private school opens and creates an additional need. Just to clarify, I'm sorry. No, Leva was before. Yep. Um, I just want to rephrase what I heard. There were three locations that there was the recommendation, mm -hmm. Chestnut Medford being one, Crosby Ridge being the second, and then the third location. Mm -hmm. Based on our student utilization, we felt at this time Crosby Ridge was mm -hmm. the best placement, which is a major cut through. Mm -hmm. People do that to cut the corner of Route 2. Mm -hmm and 2A and 3. Um, so, you know, I certainly see the merit in that placement. I think that if we're getting to the point where we're spending more time on traffic safety than we are on what benefits Arlington Public School students in terms of their learning and safety in arriving to school, then perhaps this is a function that we need to consider whether it is appropriately housed as the public school because mm -hmm. our purview is but is the public schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I've said my piece. Okay. Um, I just wanted to read the rest of the email that Paul sort of alluded to. Um, however, the question that arises here is whether the placement of a crossing guard near the Catholic school also provides a public benefit the public school student public school children or the community at large. If there's a benefit to the public school children, the payment for the crossing guard could be justified in the school budget. If the benefit falls to the community as a whole, then the municipal budget may be the more appropriate place to appropriate the funds. Mm -hmm. So I'm not disagreeing that there's mm -hmm. a need for a traffic supervisor there. I'm just I'm raising the question, which I think honestly was never asked before, whether it was legal for us to pay for that mm -hmm. position. Um, and saying that I think we should find that out before we reinstate it. Um, well, it and suggesting like, some other just a second, things. Jeff. I'd like to clarify one thing. As far as a traffic super supervisor pressing the traffic light, we have one at Pierce and we have one at Hardy. They're necessary there for those people that try to run the light. Our kids are still crossing when the light changes, and that's the benefit and the safety part. I am. I think the best thing, we spend an awful lot of time whenever this comes up, mm -hmm. e even if it does, has nothing to do with a private school, the best thing for us to do is try to get this put where it belongs in the police department and away from us because we, sh we are relying on a police function, the TAC group, mm -hmm. to make judgments for us to pay. Mm -hmm. So well, we did ask years ago oh, about okay. this and we were told by town council at the time that it was, it was not a violation. So. Um, you know, we have a new town council now. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a different opinion. I don't know. But years ago, we were told it wasn't a violation. Um, we have tried over the years to move this to the mm. municipal budget. And, uh, you know, it's in our budget. <clears throat> and that's, that's where it is. And we have 15 supervisors. And so, I, I don't know. I think um, there's nothing for the school community to decide at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Other than we've got a recommendation from TAC. Right. The school administration looked at it and made a, made a judgment that I support. Would you get back to us to let us know what the, the other board says if they'll come up with the funding? Oh, okay. Thank you. They, yeah, if they do, I'll let you know for sure. Oh, can I just say one thing? I mean, I, this might be something that the superintendent would say, and I don't want to step on her toes either, but I mean, I think this, the public safety aspect of the traffic in, mm -hmm. in Arlington, for, especially with school starting Tuesday, I mean, I think we need everybody in town to be extra cautious um, there's a lot as we said there's a lot of new students coming in a lot of new people to Arlington who may not know um, the traffic patterns as well and um, so especially you know start a lot of kids are going to be out walking to school driving to school next week and we would ask everyone to be to be Absolutely. cautious thank you 
Well said. All right. Um, Lord Chesson is would just give you a quick update on some some uh, issues around technology with Thompson, and we can do a much more in depth. Uh, presentation about technology this year mm -hmm. um, as you know uh, Thompson will be our first one-to-one -one school where there will be one iPad for every student um, teachers also uh, were given MacBooks um, as part of the construction budget so that they would be easily be able to translate the files that they would do on the MacBook to the iPads and and vice versa we had about a hundred teachers so that exceeded the Thompson teachers um, during the uh, early part of August and I think the best way to sum this up is to, for me to read a quote from uh, Anita Christina Calcaterra who was a teacher fourth grade teacher at Brackett um, who participated in a very unique role at the university she was one of the instructors but also one of the students in the sense there were times when she worked with teachers as an instructor but there were times when we brought instructors from outside and she participated as a student and uh, I asked teachers for feedback, and this is what she sent me. Tech University prepared teachers to use iPads by providing them with direct instruction and opportunities for hands-on creation with iPad applications at a range of levels from both the very novice to the very experienced. It provided mixed-level groups where several presenters guided teachers through in-depth use of applications, how to differentiate with iPads, classroom management tips, and innovative applications available to the pilot. Presenters skillfully met the range of the skills of the mixed groups. In addition, it was a wonderful opportunity to learn from colleagues the results of their work in the pilot iPad program, collaborate with others with the technology to design curriculum, and to be part of discussions as many, many questions were asked and answered about a range of topics from tips on sharing iPads to troubleshooting storage problems. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very, very exciting time for all the teachers that were there, and I'd like to again thank um, the Arlington Educational Foundation for their grant that made the Tech University um, possible and it is something that I could see us uh, holding every summer because the teachers felt they not only learned uh, the, the technology but they were able to do curriculum work at the same time together thank you the last thing um, I've apprised you of but I think it's worth talking about here at the table is the parking situation here at the high school um, we were notified the school was notified for the first time on August 26th. I know that there is some belief on the part of selectmen that we were notified in June. That's not accurate. We were notified on the 26th that um, what was going to be happening is that the, there was going to be much stricter enforcement of uh, parking on Mass Ave and the side streets. And I know that this comes from um, perhaps concerns of residents on some of the perpendicular streets into Mass Ave. But it is a major concern right, right at the moment. Um, it's this, the enforcement lease on Mass Ave is going to be um, not strictly enforced if teachers have decals at Arlington High School. But it's still something that we have to figure out a solution to. The problem we have here at the high school is that there's not enough parking places for all of the staff and teachers. But there's also no parking for students and we don't have a busing program here and Mass Ave is an artery, yes, but we also have students that um, come from parts of town where um, it may not be easy to get public transportation and certainly perhaps a long walk to school so this is a this is something that's going to be an issue that that we're going to look at a little bit more carefully over the next couple of weeks but it was a bit of a surprise um, coming out of the clear blue two days before school was uh, teachers were coming for the first day and of course it, as you can imagine it created a little bit of a, um, a firestorm mm -hmm. in the school and uh, but I'm working with the town manager, and we're going to see what uh, we can do over the next couple of weeks. So just to clarify, they're not going to enforce the traffic rules and orders, Article 5, Section 2, Schedule 1, if you have an AHS decal as a teacher? For the next couple member. of weeks, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are, are they going to are they going to give us time to get the decals to the teachers? Or do we, do we already have them? We have decals. 
Okay. How about the students? As far as well, my, my understanding from the selectman's office that they will be allowed to buy a uh, the same thing the AC students have for the the, par the public parking no. lot. No. No. They won't be allowed. No. To? No. There's that's no provision for that at the moment. That's my understanding. Well, you're they, now going right, to see me did. flip go the other side. What's good for the private school in town should be just as good for the public students. Mm -hmm. If they're using a municipal parking lot, which is they're able to buy that at fifty dollars a, a month. There is no municipal parking lot nearby, you know, downtown. It's a municipal street, municipal parking lot. They can set a permit if they want. Yeah. And my question is, and I've, I've got to be really serious about this: Is this targeted against us, or is the selectman actually going to insist on rigorous parking enforcement from one end of Mass Ave? to the other, including the box truck at Lake Street. Are they going to take Chestnut Street, which is full of cars every day and it's no parking uh, any time Monday through Friday, and there's never a ticket there and it's always parked up? Are they going to take Chestnut Terrace, which is no parking at any time, and start enforcing that? Are they doing something rigorous throughout the town, or is this just another special situation where we're going to have inconsistent and targeted enforcement against the people they decide to go after. That's my question. And there are, you can purchase a permit for day and night parking at a reduced rate at any uh, on on street parking on on public on the public roads in here. Uh, that's I would, they, you know, they can set anyway, the rules any way they want. I, I think we should leave this to the superintendent to get more clarification. I, I'm sure you're going to protect our students as well as the teachers. I think the selectmen are reasonable people. They don't want to make it impossible for kids to learn and teachers to teach. So I think that we need to, Kathy needs to meet with them and maybe some, Paul is, in, is uh, excited about this, so maybe Paul should be the liaison on this. <laughs> to the we do have a selectman's liaison. Yeah, who is the liaison? I mean, does I anyone know? Is it Chuck? I think it's uh, Mr. Pierce, yeah. It's usually been uh, Mr. Mr. And Mr. Pierce is a most reasonable person. And he's I think the here, selectmen so we would, job. I think the selectmen would much rather see him on this issue than me. Um, maybe you both well, should maybe, yeah, maybe you should both go the, the, mm -hmm. good, the good and the bad part. But I, 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 think, I, I think that we should see if we can't, if this isn't really resolved right away, we're going to have to do things to <laughs> maximize the parking on our property. And that might involve uh, uh, doing some pretty drastic things to recover spaces for uh, public school department employees because we have control over the parking spots on our property even though they're let's say municipal people who might be parking in them and if the, uh, the town is willing to go and give a permit for their employees to park on the street maybe that'll work out who knows but if there's a lot of cooperation between us and the town, we let them use our parking lots overnight for overnight parking, uh, we, we really should get everybody in the same room and, and come up with some sort of a, a long-term strategic plan for working this out. And, and the fact is that the selectmen would go and pass these regulations and, uh, and quietly announce vig rigorous enforcement around the high school without consulting us and without consulting the superintendent, I, th I think it, it is a problem. And I think that we need to uh, request, uh, in, in fact, I'll make a motion uh, requesting that the selectmen meet with the school committee to discuss parking issues surrounding the high school. Do we have a second? Yes. Any discussion? I mean, Would you like a, an I'm amendment good. to that? I just, you know, I just wanted some clarification. We could, I'm happy to, it's always good to have a meeting with the selectman to talk about anything. But are you, are, which, are you who are you meeting the manager with? Manager and I are going to be working on this over over the next couple of weeks. And why don't I just report back to you? And, 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 and my suggestion would be just to wait on that until we can work. Yeah, see I, I what think we can do. We have a meeting on September twelfth. Twelfth. Mm -hmm. So today, so two weeks from today, you're going to give us a report on the progress of your discussions with the town manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens on the 12th. When you report back on the 12th, if there's, <clears throat> there's no resolution, then I think that's the next step. Well, no, then I think I'll withdraw, wait, 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 I'll withdraw the motion then okay. and, uh, and just ask that this get on the agenda for the next meeting. Good. Casey, did you have something? I was going to. Okay. 
Leva. Um, I agree with Paul's withdrawal of the motion, but actually part of the reason I did second the motion is one thing we have historically done is have a joint meeting with the selectmen mm -hmm. at various points. I'm not mm -hmm. sure when our last one was, mm -hmm. um, but given the nature of some of these issues that are coming up, it might be worth um, discussion about whether that is an option for this year to Mm -hmm. pretty much make sure that we are all on the same page because mm -hmm. we are one town. Mm -hmm. I think that meeting should be left to the chair and uh, the superintendent and the selectmen to work that out mm -hmm. on a basis. You will report back to us on this. Well, My only concern is the, the potential ticketing of students between now and then. So hopefully the, the, you can resolve it. Before. I, I don't know about whether I can resolve that, but I, I I know that the high school principal, Mr. Janger, is going to notify parents, okay. or has, I think, already notified parents. Thank you. And students, I would hope. Pardon? I think the notification needs to be going not just to parents, but to students, because the students are going to be driving. And I don't know, from what I'm seeing with my middle school or by high school, I doubt that there's going to be that, you know, it's like, go to, you know, they're off to school. I'm just saying that let's make sure we're notifying the people who are actually going to be getting the tickets, which I think is going to be the students. I'm sure there will be a, a lot of discussion the first day of school on, on this. They have assemblies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. Good. <laughs> right, Ms. Sarathan. Is that it? Do you have any more? No, I don't. Okay. Moving on. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, policies and procedure, Mr. Thielman. Okay, so we have a number of policies to go over and just to <clears throat> clarify in June early June the subcommittee adopted um, modifications to policy BDFA E-2 which is the district wide goal setting and performance objective process and CBI and CBI E so I want to talk about those for I want to take them in chronological order okay. Mr. Hayner said the other day at the meeting, aren't we already done with this? Aren't they, shouldn't they be on the uh, website? Shouldn't they be posted? But the fact of the matter is the chronology is this. We, we adopted these. We made this recommendation on June 5th. We brought these to the retreat that we had in June. We discussed these at the retreat. The discussion at the retreat, we, there was, so there's been no change. We all agreed to this at the retreat. However, <clears throat> um, that's not a first reading. The retreat's not a first reading. So we have to do a first reading tonight and then people can make amendments to these policies at a second reading on September 12th. So it's pretty much what you saw at the retreat. There's absolutely no change. It's what we agreed to in terms of the new process with the superintendent for both BDA-E-2 and CBI and CBI-E. So it's what we agreed to, what we discussed at the retreat. It's just basically um, a new cycle that's consistent with the evaluation process that the state has created. So that's the first reading on CBI uh, and CBI-E and BDA, BDFA-E-2. Does anyone have any comments or additions you want to um, add? Sorry. I just want to state for the record, I am still concerned about having May 15th as the deadline for submitting district goals and that we won't get MCAS data and stuff. I'm, I'm concerned about what data they're going to be using to set, but I also understand there's the contractual obligations of the new district educator evaluation system. So Thank I'm you. just voicing a concern. Leva. Um, I just want to point out on BBA that I think. Um, We're not doing that one oh, yet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Get We're not there yet. Why did you move it to the right? Sorry. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we all, I think we all had the same concern about the May 15th deadline. But it's, it, there's a contract, so right. I'm not sure what else we can do. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's, those are two policies. That's first reading. Okay, so now let's go through the second, the, the first reading of all the ones we adopted the other day. Uh, so now, now we'll go back to the order. Okay, BBA. Um, during the uh, sessions we had with the MASC on our governance, we... Um, we, we, we questions were raised in those sessions about clause 10 of policy BBA. So the subcommittee met earlier in August and then earlier this week to talk through the concerns that were raised about clause 10 and we came up with this modification which is 
basically saying approval of new, I'm sorry, approval of job descriptions for new positions with reference to qualifications for employment, salary schedules, annual budget, and other personnel policies is, is in our purview. Approval of changes to the job descriptions of the superintendent, assistant superintendent, chief financial officer, and special education director, because we hire those folks according to, to the law. Uh, be informed by the superintendent of modifications to job descriptions for posted positions and ensure that the district has updated job descriptions on file for all personnel. So our feeling was that anything new, any new position, the, 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 the committee, subcommittee's feeling was that the school committee should still continue to um, approve those positions. Obviously, we approve any changes to the pe people we hire directly. <clears throat> we should be informed about any modifications to job descriptions for posted positions. And we should ensure the policies should, you know, say that we ensure that the district has updated job descriptions on file for all personnel. And so uh, that's it. That's the first reading on that one. I, yes, um, on that one, while well, this doesn't pertain to a section that's been altered, I believe there was a formatting issue that changed. Yeah, right, right. I, I okay, just, you're just gonna, pull it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and thank you for modifying that for all concerns. Thank you. I'd uh, just like to uh, inform uh, the representative from the newspaper. These are first readings, and they are not, uh, they are not ready for publication. Well, they're, they're public documents. Yes, public documents. but they will not be policy until after the second reading. Yeah, they're not adopted. We're just pre presenting them for the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's... Okay, so now we're on... Okay, so the, okay, so there's two other, I guess it's not on the agenda, but it, it wasn't listed, but there's two other policies that we took up at our meeting on earlier this week. GBCA, staff health. <clears throat> the reason why this needs to be deleted, the pink one, mm -hmm. is because uh, it's, it's, the law was changed. The law was uh, uh, deleted. What am I trying to say? The law was taken. The, the law, law that it references is has been and repealed. repealed right so repealed. we can't have a policy that requires us to comply with a repealed law yeah. so that's GB GA mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> GDE dash GDF needed to be consistent with our contracts support staff recruiting posting of vacancies support staff hiring so that means deleting the first paragraph and basically just having two sentences. When a vacancy occurs in a support staff position, the vacancy will be posted following applicable collective bargaining agreements. Interviews of support staff applicants shall be conducted by the immediate supervisor of the position being filled. So it's that simple. It just makes it consistent with all of our contracts. Mm -hmm. That was something that Rob picked up. And, and then the third one, <clears throat> I mean, the, I don't know, the next one is the bullying uh, prevention policy. It's a little... Anything highlighted, the highlights, uh, anything highlighted is new language that is consistent with the law, and this was developed by our legal counsel. The subcommittee went through it with Cindy Bouvier at the meeting earlier this week, and we adopted this. We, we, had, we recommended this to the full school committee for adoption. So basically the changes, Kathy, you should help me out in case I'm missing something here, but <clears throat> bullying is the repeated use by one or more students, and then there's a new language, I'm reading in the second paragraph that's highlighted, or by a member of a school staff, including, but not limited to, an educator, administrator, school nurse, cafeteria worker, custodian, bus driver, athletic coach, advisor to an extracurricular activity, or paraprofessional. So basically, the law now adds adults. <clears throat> um, and then on page three of five, investigation procedures, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph. Um, <clears throat> the, the, sent, the paragraph that begins with confidentiality, the law adds to the extent consistent with the school's obligations to investigate and take appropriate action. At the bottom of page three, at a minimum, the principal or his or her designee shall contact the parent or guardians as to the status of the investigation on a weekly basis. Um, the next one, if a violation is found, the parent of the targeted student will be informed of what steps will be taken to support the student and to prevent further acts of bullying or retaliation so long as consistent with applicable legal restrictions. For example, specific information about disciplinary action taken will be generally not be released to the target parents or guardian unless it involves a stay away or other directive that the target must be aware of in order to report violations. And then in the next paragraph, 
the, what is added is disciplinary action for staff who have committed an act of bullying or retaliation shall be in accordance with expectations and standards appropriate to their roles and responsibilities. So essentially what this, the law does now is it adds a requirement that staff are included in this and there's a notification uh, for parents. Um, did I get it? Mm -hmm. You did. You so I want to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. Says, um, the new law is adult to student. Yes. Mm -hmm. but adult not to student. adult to adult. Correct. Good point. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. that's right. Correct. And that's why the language was written the way right. it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's it for first reading. Any questions? Um, the school committee, the subcommittee agreed to look at uh, section G which is all about personnel because we have new collective bargaining agreements and there were several policies that are inconsistent with their agreements. There's four policies we're gonna work. We have not set a meeting for the next, a date for mm -hmm. our next meeting, but we will. And there's four policies Rob is working to revise. Yes. That's it. Thank you. Uh, budget, uh, Ms. Stocks is not here, so. Community relations? No report. Uh, curriculum instruction and assessment accountability? No report. Facilities, no report. Uh, legal Services Review, Mr. Pierce is not here at the moment. Um, uh, is that's me. We'll discuss our recommendations in executive session. Thank you. Uh, as the chair, uh, I apologize for my nervousness and am remiss in uh, not introducing Valerie uh, Sarazin, the AEA rep sitting over here. And I would like to offer my congratulations to the administrative staff for the opening uh, days, the two days that I attended uh, last Monday, uh, the new teachers up at Audison, the excitement, other than making me feel very, very old, I thought they were all very young and energetic teachers and excited. I saw a couple of them afterwards. They were excited about uh, the programs that uh, Dr. Chesson provided them. And then yesterday, seeing the whole faculty here uh, was the enthusiasm. And I publicly would like to commend Dr. Bodie and her remarks. Uh, they were they held me, and not often on the first day can I say that about a superintendent. They were, they were very well and uh, very well done. So thank you very much, and please pass it on to the whole staff, mm -hmm. including the teachers, their enthusiasm. Okay, um, am I remiss on the agenda that I'm looking at? We do not have anything on the consent agenda? Okay, so moving on to uh, executive session at this time. Uh, could I impose on Mr. Schlickman to read it? Um, I move that we go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. For the purposes of uh, discussing the Unit C contract and to discuss contract with Stoneham, Chandler, and Miller and a potential renewal of that contract. And we will be coming, sorry, thank you for the second, we will be coming uh, out of executive session back to uh, the public session uh, for a potential vote. Mm -hmm. I'll call the roll. Aye. 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 Thank you. We're now adjourned for our executive session. We are returning from executive session to our regular session. Uh, at this time, I will uh, entertain a motion. Okay. Um, I move that the school committee uh, authorize the chair to accept and sign on their behalf the new agreement with Stoneham Chandler Miller for uh, the next three years of legal services and retainer. Um, it references a letter dated August. The services are described in a letter dated August 29th to Mr. Pierce. And attachments. For a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Um, I'd like to, Mr. Pierce had asked that I read his statement of uh, why he was recommending the uh, Renewal. Stoneham Chandler Miller, so this is a note from Mr. Pierce who was unable to be here. 
this evening. Stone of Chandler Miller is experienced, professional, and has an ongoing relationship with the district that is beneficial to both parties. Institutional memory and knowledge of the way things are done in Arlington is present here, and we should take that into account. It is the most cost-effective way to handle our, our general school law and special education legal matters. We've learned that many firms, not many firms do this type of work, and those that do charge more than SEM. It represents a collective effort to better clarify and enumerate the responsibilities of both parties. It represents a compromise in, the, the exchange, in exchange for a significantly reduced hourly rate, a retainer plus arrangement that many districts do not have the benefit of having with a law firm. The APS will contract for three years and use SCM exclusively for general law, school law and special education matters. Finally, we have seen growth in our long-term relationship. For example, more clarity in our relationship is evidenced by this proposed agreement and different attorneys having been assigned to handle our cases responsible for better serving our needs, and more growth is expected. Indeed, Attorney Stein has made ever, every effort to say that even after a vote of approval of a new agreement with SCM, further communication about our ongoing relationship with them is not only helpful but welcomed. Um, so he wrote this in recommendation of supporting the renewal of this. I'd like to add, for me, speaking on a personal level, I feel that um, Stone of Chandler Miller has addressed some of the issues and concerns that we had brought forward, and I hope that our relationship will continue to grow and thrive. Yes, I am. Do you have anything? Uh, yes, please. Um, I'm going to be voting in support of this. Um, in addition to it being the recommendation of the subcommittee and our superintendent, um, I have found over the years that they have been responsive to the directives of our district administration, and I believe this is in the best interest of our continuing um, work with our students, and I will therefore be voting to support this. I don't really add. Yeah, you know, this for me this is kind of a tough vote because I'm out of my area of expertise, uh, and we've got three people with I think it's three people with law degrees uh, on this committee, two of which have one opinion, one has the other. Um, I, I, I think that uh, in my mind it's sort of a close vote, but uh, given where we are right now in the process and what we have before us. Uh, it, it's not an ideal situation, but I think it's the best option for the district, which is why I'm voting yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to make it clear from the outset that the following statement is my opinion. I will be voting against continuing with Stoneman, Chandler, and Miller as the Arlington School Committee's legal counsel for special education and general school law issues. This committee and past committees have invested a lot of money in this firm. I believe that Stoneman, Chandler, and Miller have not always acted in the best interests of the Arlington school system in that they tend to be reactive rather than proactive in their legal advice. I believe that Arlington school system would be better served by seeking other counsels to re represent us in special education and school law matters. Does anyone else have anything to say? I'll call the vote. Aye. 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 Nay. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.